What's that, operator? All right, wait a minute now. Here's the 20 cents. Hello, Pa? This is Eddie. I'm at camp. I say I'm at the camp. Yeah. I've been waiting in line two hours to make this call, Pa. Huh? I'm fine, Pa. How are you? Am I okay and Beanie? Ah, oh, that's good. Look, Pa, listen. Here's why I'm calling. I'm going to be home over the 4th. Yeah. Two-day pass. No, 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 no. By train. I'll get in around dinner time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, look, Pa, a lot of guys are waiting to make calls, so I better hang up. Uh-huh. Okay, I see you Monday night. Bye. Columbia presents Corwin. From Hollywood, Norman Corwin brings you the rising young Warner Brothers star, Dane Clark, in a new play for radio entitled Home for the Fourth. The musical score is composed and conducted by Bernard Herman. Dane Clark in Norman Corwin's Home for the Fourth. I had to wait in line two hours for my ticket. One way? Oh, round trip. Uh, 1423. And then when I got on the train, it was crowded. Do you mind if I sit here? No, not at all. Here, let me help you with that suitcase. Thank you very much. And at the second station, a lot more people got on, and they had to stand in the aisles. One of them was a pregnant woman, and nobody seemed to be offering her a seat, so I got up and gave it to her, and I stood in the vestibule. A corporal from Camp Wood was standing there, and we fell to talking. What camp is from? Manny. But you'll be glad to get home, huh? Oh, I'll say. I've been gone eight months. You married? No, but I'll sure be glad to see my girl again. How about you? I've been married two years. Yeah? Yeah, two years next August. Well, I thought about getting married, but I don't know. Getting married is pretty serious. You the only son in your family? No, I got a brother, Jim, in the Air Force overseas and a kid sister. Why? Well, sometimes it makes a difference. Your brother in the invasion? No, he's a meteorologist with the ground forces based in England. Uh-huh. Is there a diner on this train? Oh, I don't think so. I'm getting hungry. Me too, but I'm going to wait till I get home. I'll be home just in time for dinner. And I think I could eat a small-sized horse. What I didn't tell him, because he looked so doggone hungry, was that my mother makes the best southern fried chicken in the world. He went to look for some chow, and I just stood there, biding my time, listening to the wheels... Gets to be a kind of a music after a while. Mm. Oh. I got a, I, I got a hand in your mind. You haven't lost a touch. Um, well, look at all the practice I've had in making chicken this way for twenty-four years. Mm. It wasn't so good in the experimental stages, though. I can remember when we were first married. Oh, now, George, you don't have to spoil it. The armed forces like my cooking. You can at least let me have the compliment to myself. That's huh? right, Ma. Stick up for your rights. Mm. Subversive propaganda, son. The first thing you know, she'll begin to think woman's place isn't in the kitchen. Besides, <laughs> tomorrow is Independence Day. What's the use of the 4th of July without fireworks? Oh, Beanie, sit up in your chair and eat your chicken. I'm not hungry. Well, sit up anyway. On speculation. You couldn't slouch like that in a wax, Beanie. I'm too young for wax anyway. Well, you're not too young to eat, dear. Come on now. Think of all the hungry people in Europe. I told you I'm not hungry, please. Well, no wonder you're not hungry, please. Oh, eating yes. cookies all afternoon. Well, I made the cookies specially for Eddie, and I had to take them to see if they were good. Didn't mm-hmm. I see with them only human? No, that's, that's <laughs> open to some debate. I, I don't think humans sit that way at meals. No. Orangutans, maybe, but not humans. What's orangutan? A sergeant. Oh, oh, Eddie. Oh. <laughs> Incidentally, Eddie, I, I met Bill Gargan today. Oh, how is Bill? Oh, he's fine. Lieutenant. Got a ten-day spell before going overseas. 
Says he might drop in to dinner. Good, I'd like to see him. Hmm, uh, when are you going to see Rita? Hmm. Well, she doesn't get off work till 8, and then she's coming over. Oh. Oh. Aren't you marry Rita, Andy? I would if I were. Ma, would will you sit down? I'll bring in the coffee. No, sir, you, you stay where you are. Good no idea. Home for a day and a half, and he wants to wait on the train. Well, I hope you, Ma. That's a good girl, Benny. Oh, I do it all the time. Well, have a cigar, Eddie? No, thanks. I'll smoke my pipe. Uh, how many of these things do you smoke a day? No, oh, about seven or eight. Mm, that's too many. You don't like to see you smoke so much. Yes, Father. Okay, son. See that you cut down. <laughs> Good. Well, how do you think things are going in the invasion, Ed? Oh, I think they're going fine now. This new offensive that started in the West with the taking of Minsk and our, our secured beachhead. Man. Sure, but I, I don't see how it can last. Oh, great work, summer. Ed. Great work. They sent me doing a grand job. There's a sergeant in my company who's had some people come back from overseas. Did you hear from Mr. McCausland? No, I'm expecting a wire from him tonight. Be careful, dear. You spill the cream, Dean. Well, why'd you phone so far, Ma? Say, Pa, what did Jim say in his letter? Oh, it's a fine letter. Show it to you after dinner. Gee, it's a swell letter. Jim sent home a picture of him standing with a British girl in uniform. Uh, I'm glad your brother Jim isn't in the fighting in Normandy. Mm, I'll bet he's not glad. Well, he's doing his part. They need good meteorologists at the bases in England. Two or three? Thousands of them. No, I mean how many lumps of sugar? Oh. One. Say, take a look at the little finger, will you? Yeah. Very fancy. Where did you learn to drink tea like that, Jeannie? The movie? Lady the Havlin drinks tea like that? <laughs> the farm oh, that's the probably farm. your telegram. No, I think it's Rita for me. Well, maybe it's Olivia to Havlin for me. No, it's probably for me. It's probably for me. Wait a minute. Hello? Yeah, this is me. Hey, for me. Yeah. You know me, Paul? Oh, I know. Sally, do you want to know Sally? This is good for three cats for nice. That's it. Beanie, please limit your call to five hours. Now, you used to be just as bad on the phone with Rita. Yes, but Rita didn't live next door. <laughs> More coffee, Edward? No, no, thanks, Mom. You, Dad? Yes, thanks. All right. Hey, get a load of that edifying phone conversation, will you? That's all of it. Listen, listen. She's lost on you, Gloria, for cheese, and you can tell I said so, too. Well, she was Miss Keeley's pet all last year. She used to bring her apples. Yeah, and one day she brought her a catalog. It turned out to be rotten. <laughs> uh, incidentally, what? what do you think about my marrying Rita before I'm sent overseas? Hmm? Well, son, uh, do you love her? Well, sure I do. But you see, I- I've just been wondering whether, well, the war being what it is, you know, uncertain and... One of them, I'm kidding myself into thinking that I ought to get married now instead of waiting and... Well, if you have to think about it, then I don't surrender to get married. Oh, is that so? Well, you thought about it long enough before you married me. You called six years long? Edward, if you want to get married, then I say... Oh, that's probably Reed at the door. Well, maybe my telegram. No, no, I'll go. Hello, you. Rita. You're looking well, Edward. So are you. Ask me in, darling. Oh, come here. You're full of lipstick. It's all right. Mark of honor. Here's my handkerchief. All off? Yes. Let's go inside. chatted for a while. Ma made Rita have some dessert and coffee. Beanie was still on the telephone, of course, until Pa made her hang up because he was expecting a wire from somebody. And then the folks, huh, you know how they are, they figured Rita and me hadn't seen each other for a while, so they sent Beanie to bed and then announced they hadn't been out in the air all day and they simply had to go for a walk. So Rita and I went in the living room and I turned on the radio. Bringing you the winner of the local high school Independence Day essay contest, Mr. Herbert Gates, Jr., reading his prize-winning paper entitled, What the Fourth of July Means to Me. Mr. Gates. Tomorrow is the Fourth of July. It is our National Day of Independence and is celebrated wherever Americans are or whatever they are doing. July 4th, 1944 or July 4th, 1776. The American people have always celebrated this day. And that will give you some idea of how important it is. Get something else. What good American is not thrilled at the sight of the house? Yes. 
I sure miss the radio at camp. Uh, I don't get a chance to hear it much either with my job the way it is. I suppose. Did you by any chance hear the lonesome train a couple of months ago? No. What's that? A new song by, about Lincoln. No, I didn't hear it. It was pretty good. It's too bad you missed it. Yeah. Did you miss me? What do you think? What do I think? Yeah. I think that you're more wonderful than I imagined. Imagined? Yes. Yeah. You want to know something? I used to think about you. I used to imagine you every day. Every night. I'd I, I take your picture out when I was alone. I'd look at it. I didn't pin it up on the wall because I almost didn't want to share it with anybody. I... Oh. I love you, Rita. Do you really? Of course I do. Are you as mad to be with me as, as I am to see you? <laughs> yes, Miss Schieffer. And you still want to marry me? Yes. Then why don't we get married before you go overseas? Well, it's like I said before. What did you say before? Well... Now, supposing I go in and I get shot up, so you've got an invalid husband on your hand. Just suppose I'm killed and, and you're a widow. All right, suppose I'm lost or something. I'm reported missing. Uh, Ed, that's silly. You, you know I love you enough to face up to anything that might happen. Darling, is it that you're afraid to marry me? Oh. Is it that you're not sure you love me? Don't be afraid to tell me if that's how you feel. No, no, that's silly. I do love you. Oh, only... Well, it's only that I'm... I'm kind of hipped on the subject, I guess. I've I, I just got the kind of a conscience that simply won't let me... Get... Oh, no, don't look like that, darling. I... Uh, I'm all right. Sweetheart, let's not talk about it, huh? Let's just be glad to be together. It's so long since I've seen you. Yes. Yes, of course it is. <laughs> sitting there on the sofa for about a half hour, and then we heard voices out on the porch. And we figured the folks must be back in their walk, so we went out and we joined them. They were talking with Bill Goggins, who'd met them on their way up the street. Pa was deep in an argument yes, with Bill. I know what I'm talking about, Bill. I fought in the last one. It was the same thing then. They said it was a war to end war, and so on and so forth, but it wasn't anything of the kind. It's the same thing today, all over again. Well... I disagree with you, Mr. Eakin. It's an entirely different war. In in hey, in the first going place. On here? Well, hello, Adam. Hello, how are you? Fine, I'm glad. Yes, you know, Rita, don't you? Yes, yes of yes, course. Yes. How are you, dear? What oh. are you doing? I'm working in a machine and tool factory now. Oh, oh so don't let's you. interrupt this dog fight. Carry on, gentlemen. Oh, well, we weren't arguing. It's just that Bill here seems to think it can change human nature. Uh, no. No, I don't believe that's an issue at all, Mr. Eakin. If uh if anything in, uh, people's instincts are against war. Was it human nature that got Ed and me in the uniform? No, it was draft board number 17. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it wasn't human nature. It was a very inhuman, unnatural thing. Like what? It was fascism, Ed. That's right, Bill. Why, sure. After all, uh, peace and not war is so much a part of human nature that well, most of us just refused to believe that the fascists deliberately intended to make war. And we waited until it was almost too late. I still think we're going to have another war after this one. And so do I. Oh, Eddie, you don't. Sure I do. That's defeatist talk, if you ask me. Mr. Eakins, you mean you don't think anybody will have learned anything out of this war? No, I think it's exactly the same kind of war as the last one. Absolutely, I agree with my old man. Well, your old lady doesn't agree with your old man. I think we've made a lot of progress. Good for you. Such as what? Well, the Atlantic Charter and the 
pay her on contracts. I and... bet you don't even know what they stand for. How much do you want to bet, oh, hmm? Oh, never mind, never mind. When you talk that way, you probably know. Well, mm-hmm. what do they stand for? The Tehran Agreement called for the big three to continue cooperating after the war. Well, I ought to know that when I lecture to the East Side Women's Club about it. It says that Britain, Russia, and we are planning for the day when all the people in the world can live free lives. Free from tyranny and, uh, well, if I remember the wording, uh, according to each one's varying desires and uh, his own conscience. Isn't that right, Mrs. Eaton? Correct. Oh, that all sounds fine, but when I tell you it's idealistic, it, it's visionary. Well, what do you think? Look, none of the boys, Bill, that I know in the Army go for that idealism stuff, at least not in my outfit. Well, they do in my outfit. Listen, Bill, I've talked with a lot of the boys, including some who've been overseas, and the one thing they want to know is when do they get home? Sure, just as in the last war. Even our letters from Jim are full of it. Oh, soldiers in every war have wanted to go home. Certainly, if you want an example of human nature, that's one, to want to go home. But there's a, there's a big difference in this war. Oh, you hear of men wanting to come home, sure, but you don't hear of any desertions on account of it, as you did in other wars. The American soldier knows he's got to win before he gets home, or else his home won't be worth coming back to. So what's that got to do with the Tehran Conference? What's that got to do with it? Yeah. Everything. What do you suppose our men are fighting for, anyway? Oh, ideals, I suppose. Oh, chicken and every hot and dark pot. Mm, that's a fine ideal for a young American. Oh. Look, we're fighting to get it over with, and that's all. Look, I don't begin to understand your attitude about idealism. You, you and your father seem to think that it's a little embarrassing to be found dead or alive with an ideal. Sure, sure, the terror and uh, agreement's visionary. But so was our Declaration of Independence. Did you ever stop to think of that? Supposing they sat around at Philadelphia 150 years ago making cracks about long hairs and visionaries. But that's different. The Declaration of Independence involved one country in 1776 and a terror thing involved oh, a bunch of countries in another time. Of you. What? We were practically 13 separate countries back in 1776. Where's your history? Well, I know. I hear certain people speak about the ideology of this war as though it was something extra. Uh, something you could throw away, uh, dispense with, if the going gets tough. Well, I think it's a heck of a lot more important than C-rations or K-rations or sometimes even ammunition. It's the whole heart and soul of fighting. And I've talked to a lot of G.I.s, too, and in my experience, it's hardly ever the men who do the fighting who sneer at the reasons why they're fighting. Yes, and the ones who sneer are mostly high-priced columnists who spend the rest of their time kicking about the income tax they have to pay. Sure. The only time the war comes home to them... It's when they get bounced off a plane because they don't have a priority. Uh, what papers do you read, Bill? Yeah, the same papers you read, sir. And I don't have to read the editorials to form my opinion. Just the main headlines and the text of the speeches and the communiques. I've been doing that right along. So have I, ever since Spain. Well, with me, ever since Spain, sure. Yeah. Well, that's all very well. And I still say the men are fighting to get back to where we were before the stinking war. That's all they're fighting for. I think that's enough to fight for. We're not mad at anybody. Well, <laughs> look, Ed, well, neither of us is on this leave to spend our time arguing. All I can say personally is that if I'm going to die in this war, I'd like it to be for an ideal. For something, something pretty awful special. And I think the promise of Terahan is, is that... I think the whole fact and the idea of the United Nations is something good and special. Now, wait a minute, Bill. Let's get back to where we were talking about, about the Declaration of Independence. Now, in the first place... We've never left it, Eddie. We've never left it. Tehran, the Charter, all these things, they're sort of the great-grandsons of stuff like the Declaration. Certainly. If a man writes a fine document 150 years ago, he's a hero, but if he writes it today, he's a politician. Believe me, when I leave my family this trip, it'll be for the duration, maybe for a good deal longer. And if I'm not coming back, at least I want my people to have an insurance policy on my life. And the best policy I know about so far is the one the Allies wrote there at Terra Hank. Yeah, yeah. And there's a captain in my company who talks like you, too, but nobody pays any attention to him either. Oh, Eddie, what a thing to say. I think you ought to apologize to Bill. Oh, no, 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 no. no. (laughs) That's all right, Rita. Well, look, I've got to be getting along anyway, and that's as good a place as any to leave the discussion. Oh, now, hold on, Bill. You no, were... no, don't you go, Bill. Please stay and have some tea with no, me. No, no, come no, on. really, really. I, 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 you. No, no, no. Come on, come no. on, Bill, and stay. We really love you, you know. And we... I know. Even though we, we don't agree with you. Sure, Bill, I will. No, 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 really, really. Look, look, I must go. I, I make now. I told Ed and I'd drop around now, so... Well, 
Good night, everybody. And I hope that before I go, we get a chance... Oh, George, look. Here comes a boy with your telegram from the calls list. Where? Why, he's right there, crossing the street. Oh, it's about time he let me know. Nearly a whole day to labor that thing. George W. Eakins live here? Yeah. Telegram for you. So I see. I'm there. Okay. Here you are. Thanks. If there doesn't get me those reservations, I'm just going to... Look, it's all right. Well, what's he say? Oh, what is it, Pa? What's the matter, George? Here, give it to me. The War Department regrets to inform you that your son, James Trish Egan, is missing. But he's a meteorologist. Well, how can he be missing? He's stationed in England. That's... That can't be right. There must be a mistake here. Maybe it's the wrong... Jim. Jim. But it just says missing. Lots of guys who are missing later... I'm going inside. Excuse me, everybody. I'm going inside. Yeah, yeah. Let me help you, Mother. Yeah. I'm sorry, Eddie. Believe me, I'm sorry. Ed, here's... Oh, Jim's all right. He's missing, that's all. Lots of guys who are missing later turn up. Don't they, Bill? Don't they turn up later? Sure, Eddie. Lots of them. Sure. Jim isn't dead. I know that. You can't kill a guy like Jim. He'll turn up. Of course he will. Sure. Here. Can I see that? Thanks. Rita? Thanks. All right. I'm glad you're here with us right now, Bill. Can you stay for a little while? Yes, do stay, Bill. Of course. Bill, I... Come in the house. Come on in. I'll make something to drink for you. were feeling better when I left the house the next day. It was the saddest fourth of July we'd ever had. But the folks took it wonderfully well. After all, Jim is only missing. Many of the boys do show up after a while. Especially flyers who come down to enemy territory. I guess Jim must have changed his job from meteorologist to join a boat. And he never bothered to tell us. Or maybe he never was a meteorologist. Darling, your train leaves in five minutes, and you'd better stand at the gate if you want to get a seat. Just one more kiss? And make it last for three weeks. You'll come down to camp on the 30th now? Yes. I'll bring the license, too. Don't worry. Oh, yes, Mrs. Eaton. I love you. And I love you. Slow, crowded ride back to camp. I felt pretty blue. I had a smile once when a fellow on the train exploded a couple of paper bags in celebration of the 4th of July. He said it was Erzat's fireworks on account of it was a war. I 
but thinking about Jim and waiting. And about what Bill Gotham said. I decided I... I saw a life Bill. The more I thought about him, he's really a decent kind of a fellow with a good head on his shoulders. He's like Jim in a way. Yeah. Like Jim. been listening to Home for the Fourth, written, directed, and produced by Norman Corwin for CBS as the 17th in his current series of broadcasts. Dane Clark, distinguished Warner Brothers star, appeared in the role of Ed Eakins. Wally Mayer was Lieutenant Bill Goggins. Betsy Kelly played Rita. Pa Eakins was played by Paul McVeigh. And Regina Wallace was heard as Ma. Joan Loring was Beanie, and the boy was Billy Roy. Bernard Herman composed and conducted the original musical score. <laughs> Because of Columbia's coverage of the all-star Major League Baseball game a week from tonight, Columbia Presents Corin will not be heard again until two weeks from tonight, on Tuesday, July 18th, at the same time. And on that night... The Moat Farm Murder. This is Norman Corwin. I'd like to take a moment to tell you something about the program we've planned for the 18th. Last year, when I suggested to Charles Lawton that he perform the trilogy of American poets which you heard earlier this month, he made a suggestion of his own. He told me that in the court records of British criminal law, there was a remarkable confession by a bungling small-time murderer named Dougal. He said he read it on a subway train in London and was so horror-struck and fascinated that he rode three stations past his stop. Well, we looked up the confession in an old British periodical, and I read it. It was the most terrifying study of a murderer's conscience that I'd ever encountered, and I agreed that it ought to make a, an unusual broadcast. So, Charles Lawton will be doing an encore to his trilogy with the Moat Farm murder on this program two weeks from tonight. Bernard Herman will again compose and conduct an original score. Remember, Columbia Presents Corin will not be heard a week from tonight, but will return on July the 18th. This is Dick Cutting speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. WBNS, Columbia. This the Columbia Broadcasting System. WBNS, Columbia.
Four times good evening. And by this time tomorrow, may the enemies of all free men's metropolises be more desperate and damned than ever. End of salutation. <laughs> that you have a handsome profile, see, of New York, and get that over with. Long ago, you were voted the most likely to see, and tonight the 12th generation of Americans salutes you with special reference to the populace which takes you for its lawful address. The Manhattanese, Brooklynese, Astorians, Jamaicans, Bronxites, who think the rest of the world is all right visit, but who wouldn't want to live any place but here. This tapestry, being dimensioned by a half hour of your time and the arbitrary limits of the city, has for its warp the avenues, and for its weft the cross-town streets, the shuttle traveling back and forth, as you'd expect, between Grand Central and Times Square. As for loom, that's what ships do on the horizons of the city practically continuously, in which nection God bless our Navy and the ships of the Merchant Marine. So much for shuttle... Loom and West. Regarding individual threats, you will have to follow them by listening acutely, for there will be excursions and motifs, snatches of native song and speech, time signals, bulletins, reflections, and footsteps. To say nothing of the retirement of battles at first base and of ballerinas from ballet at the age of 40. However, the main design is in the middle and will be clear enough when you stand back and see the whole. The people of the city are the main design. The names in the directories, but for the grace of whom the place becomes an empty mesa and a pincushion of stone, a petrified forest of forgotten dividends and cobwebs in the elevator shafts. What that design is, you citizens of sister cities, you heroes on the plains and uplands, sit for and listen. It well may be a special hope, a pattern of felicity to you and to your kids, to fetuses conceived this month and next and ever after. That, as I say, comes later. But it's in the weave. If we'll stay and look it over with us in a certain light... Robert Montgomery in a uniform. So what do you want me to do, break a leg? Pick any street in the city from 1 to 241 and take it over to the laboratory for an X-ray. You will find on developing both the film and yourself that the corpus wears a top hat, though it's toe scout. That there are present all the elemental backbone virtues of the species, being neither better nor worse in this regard than Kia Cut cross section that sin and sickness appear as shadows on the plate. Nothing extraordinary about that, is there, Doctor? And that all the typical figurations of love, hate, fear, passion, tribulation, joy, grief, are clearly marked and evident. Do not underestimate these people, for they are you. Do not mistrust them because of their accent, for you yourself might be incomprehensible in Oxford. So I says to him, sure, I'll miss you. Like poison, I'll miss you, I says to him. You want to see how much I'll miss you? Just stick your finger in the pond at Central Park and then pull it out and look at the hole. One feature you will notice straight away is of congestion. From German Yorkville to outlying Latin quarters, Lebensraum is nil. This is true as well of the areas of Ritz and Paris de Foie Gras, for even on those avenues where finger bowls with lilies in them must precede the coffee... Have a spot of brandy, Edgar? The next-door neighbor breathes down your incinerator shaft. You can't get the real truth about it in an almanac. The guidebooks can go only so far. They're candid enough about how the local girl made good. But just where in the index is the guy who jumped out of a window because he couldn't take it? 
Take somebody to size New York. The wind off the river may be an authority on conditions in New Jersey or even in Ohio. But what does it know about a meeting of stockholders at 1 Wall Street at 3 this afternoon? Total surplus and capital stock, gentlemen. What knowledge of shish kebab, stuffed grape and cabbage leaves available in the Syrian district? How can the Congressional Limited, which goes only as far as Penn Station, know about the beauty of the women? About the current exhibition of Cuban art? About the politics of Williamsburg? I'll fight City Hall! That's what I says to him. He got no answer. How can you tell from seat number five on the plane from Pittsburgh what goes on here? Put your nose to the cold window and look out over the starboard wing. Already you're within the city. So it's still ten minutes to LaGuardia. There's the harbor, crinkled under the influences of a bland wind. The statue of Our Lady of the Freedoms, a green speck in the blue bay. And the downtown cluster of real estate standing cool and reasonable above the vapors. What can you tell from such an altitude of the clip joints and the subway jams? and clinics of cabbages in wholesale markets and of kings in exile, of time and of the river, of star performances at Hayden's Planetarium. Do you know anything of the historic nature of these parts? George Gershwin slept here. Of flower salesmen brightening the night. Get your dark genius! Get your fresh of exports and imports of the port, aside from ammunition for our allies and reverse lend lease. If you wish a very fine cacciatella, like a chini, or from a carta, just to come to Big Della Chiapa, 1275 Brico Street in Greenwich Village. Of the telephone exchanges, the Indians with feathers, Algonquin for, and fat old Dutchman, Stuyvesant 99598, nine, and Spanish gold, Eldorado 5, please, and Englishman at play. I'm calling Bowling Green 99970. Nine, nine, Salute au monde. Oh, Whitman. Whitman. Of Manhattan, the sun. Where are you tonight, Walt Whitman? Call in Whitman, will you, boys? Sure. Whitman? Whitman! Walt Whitman! Hey, Walt! Whitman! Look for me under your boot soles. There you are. Walt, we ask of you a sentiment about this place. That's all we ask. Guess he didn't hear you. Uh, Just a line that we can quote for our broadcast. A great city is that which has the greatest men and women. We thank you. We thank you in behalf of the conjoined creeds, the speakers of the foreign and the ancient tongues. Exodae quasimus domine supplicum prece et competentiam de departem contas et parte nobis indulgentiam revolas. Lord God of hosts, there are very many voters in this town. Your angels would be doing well to know the names of half of them. It is beyond the power of certified public accountants to follow all the comings and goings of the people, to and fro and up and down, especially on weekends and around October 1st. Only the Lord himself could tell just what a man from Harlem thinks this moment riding downtown on the 8th Avenue Express. Yea, even the hushed transepts of the church might confuse any but the highest. What with the differences in ritual between the Seventh-day Adventist Ephesians, West 123rd Street, the Abyssinian Baptists, 138th, and the Chinese First Presbyterians, 31st Street East. Mother's sleeping in the front room. Well, well, let's stay out here on the steps a while, huh? I have to punch a clock on Canal Street at nine in the morning. Well, how about me? I have to be back at camp. Well, all right, Ted. Just for a little while. Yes. A 
You'll get lipstick all over you. I'll take that chance. The season of spring has returned from a winter in South America and has already had certain intimacies with the trees of the public and private parks, as well as with the flowers and grasses thereof. It has also appeared in various guises, mostly beguiling, but occasionally overcast with prevailing northeasterly winds. However, on sunny days, somewhat hazy in the morning, clear by noon, it stands leering outside office windows. It fishes for pennies in the gratings of subways and is generally pleased with itself, all the way from the Canarsie marshes to the Yonkers line. Well, I finally told him. What do you mean you finally told him? He says I only develop an interest in an individual if he happens to be socially conscious. Blame me, that's some nice. Well, personally, I think it's a compliment. It's a privilege to be socially conscious. Certainly, yeah, after all, it's a very important time in history. Well, sure. History's being made every day. So I said to him, I told him, Harry, you should read more. <laughs> Charlie, what's the score and who's in there pitching? Come on, Charlie, give us a flash from the ballpark, where the crowd is hearing a base hit to right by Mahul, sending Buxton home with a tying run. Oh, yes, Charlie. It's well to relax when the fellow needs to get out. But will you not turn to the young Jew beside you, he being a flyer of the Bronx home on convalescent leave, and cheer him for making a base hit, too? The game is almost over, bud. And the All-Stars are ahead. from there. Bolivia, Nicaragua, Colombia, the Argentine. 200,000 people speaking Spanish. A city pan-American within a city plain American. And further up line... I got em, I got em. I got nuts, I got tenders, I got hoopers, I got em. Peanuts, tenders, hoopers. I got em. Negro got Harlem em. listens to I a street peanuts. cry. And it hears a boogie-woogie piano playing a little original composition down there in the Ace of Clubs. But it ain't just song and honeysuckle, neighbor. It's a place of homes and shops, and it contains the biggest Negro concentration in the world. And if you take the trouble to go down and interview the older ducks and slips along the island, they will... If they like you, point out the ghosts of rusty, weathered piers where once fat, crowded slave ships put in from profitable hunting grounds of Africa. How many wars ago? Off these same Manhattan shores tonight, the warships of the Union ride at anchor, and men of Harlem are aboard. <laughs> When you hear the musical note, the time on the four-face Paramount clock, speaking only for the local zenith, will say, without prejudice of any kind, that it is 20 minutes after 10. I got a V letter from my boy in India yesterday, and he says he visited the Taj Mahal, but for his money, it doesn't come up anywhere near to the Empire State Building. In three-quarters of a million New York windows of all sizes and conditions, the service star gives notice to the passerby that each has sent a delegate to the Convention of the Nations with instructions to shoot on sight. Fire and blood are first on the agenda. 
and participating in the various contests, east side, west side, all around the world, is the Swede from Bruckner Avenue. Hey, will you tell Hull that I sent me a picture of the baby? Here, I got a kid two years old, and I ain't even seen him yet. And the muscular Greek corporal from 25th Street. Look, when you go back, will you tell him what we'd like is Dinah Shaw records and a transcription of a Fred Allen show? Personally, I'd appreciate a couple of snappy pin-up girls and a good, hot, vicious defado. Oh, G.I. Joe of Manhattan, the son. Your father came to the city on a big white ship. Or a dirty tramp. Or a cattle boat. And the ship had a name. But you have slipped down the Hudson in the night on a gray ship. Nameless. The hour likewise anonymous, the compass bearing sealed inside an envelope. The city of immigrants has emigrated to the wars. The borscht and the pastrami, the fine kuchen and smorgasbord, patiently await the last communique. Americans on this wavelength. Can you make out the bright green threads among the lesser colors in this tapestry? The interwoven hopes of those who turn the turnstiles? Dreams held by commuters to the well kept lawns of Scarsdale and of Greenwich? Tune in on Sunnyside. Canvas the gas house and the garment district. Take a poll of visions on Park Avenue, Hell's Kitchen and the Bowery. You will see they're not so far apart. Just hold the hopes up to a light one at a time. From Lenox Avenue, for instance. I just want my boy to come home, that's all. And with the war won, so it'll stay won. From Townman Street near Jay. I'd like to see my way clear to be able to afford a bathtub in this house. From West New Brighton. Won't it be grand to be able to fly in from Westport every morning in a helicopter? From 9th Street and Avenue D above the garage. The whole city. If it could only like the park along Riverside Drive, huh? Roller skating and handball and tennis courts and grass and trees. And all new houses instead of these old tenements. Boy, wouldn't that be something. From Sutton Place South by the whistling tugs. Just think, Paul. Your branch office in Shanghai... 36 hours across the North Pole. Pelham Bay to Liverpool in 12. Can a song of hope be sung by the graduating class of PS-186? Arranged for symphonic orchestra and choir and performed at Carnegie? Danced to at Roseland? Given the works by Milford at the Met? Could be, gentlemen. Could be. Many a hit tune has come from Broadway. Uptown on the downbeat, lads, and take it away! <laughs> City of Ginsburg and Garibaldi, Kozlowski and Lopez. What are you doing on St. Patrick's Day? Marching, of course, down Fifth Avenue. And what are you doing on San Gennaro's Day? Dancing, of course, along Mulberry Street. The rumor being there are more Italians in New York than in Napoli or Roma or Firenze. And the candles on this day, this year, burn brightly for the martyred saint. And though the sweetmeats would be sweeter far if Frankie and Pasquale were home... They taste pretty good as they are. This would be the Virgin Mary. And on Bastille Day, the French Republic's Independence Day, hardly a fortnight further into summer than our own, the tricolor is flown beside the flag that Lafayette a Lend-Lease general helped us to get started. Whereas Hungarians and Czechs and Germans, Hindus, Balkans, Portuguese and Danes, they have their little cities within the city too. Their churches and their restaurants and gift shops, movie houses, newspapers and foreign language programs on the radio. Oh, 
Is there by any chance on the island tonight a visiting fireman from Kansas City who knows somebody in Washington with connections in London? If so, would he kindly take a message to the next peace conference? The one that G.I. Joseph of 82nd Street is at the moment fighting to arrange. And see that there is smuggled in among the representatives the mere hint of the barest memorandum of a notion. Something for their scratch pads to be scrawled upon and doodled over during deepest thought. A mark. A democratic imprint. A U.S. figuration. A Yankee doodle. This is what it is. Here in the tall city with the British name, the people of all nations checkering the numbered streets, having come from Warsaw and come from Plymouth, Klein Badine and Chungking, having come from Africa and Oslo and Caracas, having worked and played and voted, loved and listened to the radio, fought in wars and paid for them as well, having kept their customs and their languages, having played their own sweet music on the fiddle and accordion, did nevertheless find time to rear and populate the greatest city in the world and make of it a symbol celebrated up and down the longitudes. You see, it can be done. Yeah. Make a note of that. It can be done. You have it on the solemn word and deed of all five boroughs, gentlemen, that nothing is impossible. Do but consult the main design and see in miniature the nations living side by side so effortlessly that no one calls it peace, yes. Block to block and house to house and door to door they get along. With scraps the times, a little botheration such as happens in the best of families, but never anything a court or free election can't take care of. Now then, you want to buy a rug? Very fine. A bargain. Genuine American. Then take a look at this. Oriental in parts, but all the compass points come into it. And see. The main design. Is that a hope or isn't it? A hope that out of little people, greatnesses, and towering accomplishments, rapid transits to tomorrow morning, and fraternity along the Grand Concourse, ahoy the century ahead! Announce it in lights above Broadway, and post it in the public library. Workers, lovers, Kids and patriots near and far along the mainstream and lesser eddies of the network. Greetings from the city! Greetings! Greetings! Forces Radio Service has presented This is the Story, a story called New York, a tapestry for radio. The script was written and directed by...
This is the story was a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. An ode of thanksgiving, written and directed by Norman Corwin, with an original musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Semler. now, the living and the dead alike, sit round our votive table and give thanks where thanks are due. We shall give thanks tonight for song and bread and such a thing as love and dogged hope and for the guarantee of morning somewhere at some season. You must bring with you to the feast an offering It can be little. One good grape, a grain of cinnamon, a sentiment, three bars of an old folk song, half a notion, a living thing that's glad of living, be it a mosquito fresh from lava or a floating spore. Sit where you will. There are no place cards here and no priority. The good right hand of fellowship is at your left and at your right perhaps an antique pharaoh or a medieval saint, a poet temporarily run out of couplets, or a plumber just arrived from the installing of a sink. Please note there is no head to this round table. Instead, an empty chair reserved for any perfect man, and uh, therefore fated to be empty. First now, the breaking of the bread. Who will say grace? St. Paul, will you kindly... He that eateth, eateth unto the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. There will be music.
music such as this throughout, for song is celebration, whether it is tune to joy or woe or to the passions in between. We who are thankful give up thanks for music and the instruments of music and the makers of the instruments of music. Yea, the sistrum and the dulcimer, the psaltery, the tabor, the cithara, the sackput, and the looping horns. Listen to the big and buxom bulls. The gentle fiddles gambling across the staves. The piquant flute. The pastoral and plaintive oboe, singing of nostalgias we must always know. And the celeste, to which the planetoids prefer to dance. Also, that wondrous instrument which can speak words and give them meaning, inflect them, playing on the mind the spirit bowstring. The human voice, the various and sweet and pungent human voice. Now seraphim, now Satan. Oh, this is a hearty congregation. Great old Greeks and grocer's clerks, and young maids from Carolina looking for careers in New York City, and a shipping clerk from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, two emperors of China, and a mild professor from Ohio, and a girl named Rhoda with rheumatic fever, farm hands, and a locomotive engineer, and sailormen, and actors' agents, and a lissom tightrope walker thankful for a solid rope beneath his feet. Each is thankful in his fashion... And his measure. I, for the earth and weathers, being a farmer, for the sun, which is good, and the rain, which is good, and for the rising before dawn, and the frosty air, and the placid animals, to whom I am the god of feed, the giver of the corn and grain. And I am thankful for the day, which is good, And the night, which is good. And for the hard one sleeping, which is also good. And I am thankful for the plow in my hand. And the tilling of the land in fall, for crops to be sown in winter. And the tilling of the land in spring, for the Indian corn of summer. I am not thankful for potato bugs, or the maize smut. But am, for the well-framed orchards, and the grafted trees, and the gathered harvest. I am thankful for the day which is good. I am thankful for the night which is good. And I am thankful for the sun. I am thankful for the rain. I am for the bay at low tide. I'm an eel fisher and a clam fisher. For the flats at low tide, I guess, and the salty smell. For my clam rake and spade, I guess, and the spear I use to snag eels with, and the bellboy off by the shoals. And then the seagulls which circle overhead and Glide along the beach all day, looking for clams, too. Like me. And I like to think sometimes of the thin rim of dried salt on the spit of sand where the last wave breaks when the tide's going out. And of the bright days when the water is blue. And the gray days when the water is gray. I'm thankful to God for clams and eels and low tide, I guess. I am thankful to God for clams and eels. I am thankful to God for clams and eels and the low tide. I, being a 
mother several times over, am thankful for the love of it and the pain of it. For the growth up from the crib and the teething and all the trouble and the coming out of trouble. For the cured abscess of the ear which Emmy had, getting better the way it did after we were so worried and sat up all night for two nights and didn't get a wink of sleep. Yes, and for Charles getting over being tongue-tied. And Joe, the wild boy, getting married to such a fine girl as Louise and settling down. And for my husband, Donald, to have lived to see his eldest daughter, Hannah, married and bringing up a nice family. And for the letters that the children write me whenever they can. And the cards they send me on Mother's Day. And for the radio when it gets lonely. Especially in the wintertime when all the summer folk have gone away. For all these things and many others, I am thankful. I am thankful for the love of it and the pain of it. I am thankful for the love of it and the pain of it. What of the season? Shall we not say thanks for seasons and the zones between them when they are neither here nor there but surely coming? For the time in March when the crocus goes to town and the robin makes reconnaissance and the icicle has given orders to relax. For the time in June when the laziest bud, the last to leaf, says, all right, I am ready. Summer may begin. Bring on the south wind, the cicadas, and the bees that I've heard so much about. Oh, surely, sure. Let this be celebrated in our best tradition by a song. By not too young a song, since spring and summer are an ancient team. A song, let's say, of summer's coming in. It must be old, but fresh, familiar, yet a little different each time met with as summertime herself. Summer is the coming in. Now, may I rise to thank the master painter of the year? Well, who's that? October. No louvre in the world is big enough to hold his landscapes. He is exhibited in every tinctured leaf and hung in every meadow. Have you seen his skyscapes? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, indeed. They say he mixes pigments out of elemental stuffs and ranges far afield. Did you know his greens come from a special patch of the Aegean? His reds from Yuma in the eyes of Bengal tigers and the powdered beaks of tropical toucans? His oranges are skimmed, they say, from surfaces of rising moons. Well, where do his tints of hazel come from? Well, hazelnuts. His plum colors? From plums. His fawn from fawns? Precisely. Is he not a marvel then, October? Yes, he is. Not worth a canticle? Oh, worth several. Here is one for now. <laughs> Ah, 
come, come. This is mockery, this festive hour. A mockery? How now? This breaking bread while famine grins in every land. This music while the whistling bomb sets pitch for all the sharp-tuned instruments of death. This talk of landscapes when the color of the earth is red and growing redder. And you know it. Are you proposing thanks? Yes, we are. <laughs> Why, if Satan himself was sitting here among us, he could reasonably proffer thanks to all of our kind for many favors done him in continuing. His horsemen thunder down the ways. His legions multiply like festering bacteria. How can our thanksgivings be unaffected knowing this? Look, no empire built of darkness and disease of soul shall give us pause. The interlocking fury of free men will, like a blinding and a sterilizing shaft of light, nullify such decay. What comes of festering bacteria in the sunlight? It doesn't matter. While we speak, new fallen angels plummet from the skies like a malignant hail. The air is a shriek with misery. Yea, the earth is fevered. Pity and mercy both are exiled to a foreign star. And charity's aghast to see a million of our brothers writhing in the puddle of their blood. Has there ever been a tempest time did not outride? The truth that was mixed in with the molten ores when still our smoking planet sought a place among the systems, that truth awaits extraction like a rare but mighty radium deep in the bowels of the earth. Those who have held it shining in their hands never will be countervailed. Never countervailed. Though crucifixion test it and armies of defenders stagger backward through the night, once we understand no weapon in the hand of any host of any hell can strike asunder man from man. Brothers are not for long divisible. Let us be thankful now for this. this thing. I who have come a long distance to this table and must go far hence. I verify this thing. That brotherhood is not so wild a dream as those who profit by postponing it pretend. It cannot be that common kindness and a working plan are more bizarre imaginings than that a man should squeeze the world into a room and speak across it casually and be heard. I am a wanderer. Was born in exile as my father was, and as my children will be. I am of a race which lives in every clime and under every flag except its own. I verify this thing. Let now the ram's horn of my father's tribe resound a note of thankfulness for perseverance and for law, for strength out of adversity and order out of chaos. Listen to it. Shrill wind blowing down the wrinkled plains of China through the selfsame wildernesses. Past the hoary head of Sinai blows the melancholy shofar. Sounds the shofar down the ages. Egypt, Jericho and Persia, Greece and Rome, and the dispersion, pogrom, ghetto, inquisition. Past the rise and fall of empires. Past the ebb and flow of eras. Through the gauntlet of affliction. Index inhumanitarum. 
clocks and fices, plague and cannon, still, above the blare of trumpets, still above the brass of hatred, blows the horn of benediction. Men have listened. Men have listened. They will listen yet tomorrow for the horn of benediction. For the horn of benediction. May I speak for a moment, having but a moment left to speak in? I, too, am listening for a horn to blow, one which will call me from this time and place to another time and place. In this, my 92nd year, my eyes grown dim, my hearing poor, sleeping most of the time, the foothills of sleep before I reach the mountains. I am thankful for still, clear memories, both big and little, happy and sorrowful. Of the dress I wore at Lincoln's second inaugural ball, of meeting Edward on a sleigh ride one December night when the moon was new and Mount Toby lay frozen under stars that seemed so low you could almost touch them. Of the morning Ralph was born, of how little Edwina died of the diphtheria. Of all the other memories, the many, many other things too full to hint at, too many to contain. I, I joke with my grandchildren when they come to see me now. I tell them I'm like a minute man, ready to go at a moment's notice. Would you pardon my appearance, good friends all? I am but lately risen from the grave. One of a hundred who were stood one morning, one bright morning, between a dozen muzzles and a wall. Tonight it rains where we were lowered in the ground. A rain of mid-November falling cold upon the countryside. Spreading its sorrows over, cautioning the earth that winter is coming... Winter in the bone, and winter in the flesh, and winter on the clean-swept hearthstone. We who are so early quiffed of this sweet place, young and unready for the quiet, loving the tug of the wind and the swaying grass, the pillowing breasts of our beloved, and the laughter of our children, loving the look of the day in the east, but seeing it no more, turned turned away and face to face with night. We who are solemn with dust upon our lips whisper now our thankfulness in chorus that we have been noted, that we shall not be forgotten, that good men, good understanding men, have noted that we shall not be forgotten. For this, for this, for this much thanks. Sons of men... Daughters of the mingled lovers of the many tribes who make us what we are. Brothers, sisters by the millions, 
sitting with us at this table, and circled round us through the far, wide-spreading states. What year this is, we shall not soon forget. Remark it, each of you belonging to it, this year shall skulk among the blackest annals ever, pitied, wondered on, and sung about as long as our posterity looks back to see the how and why of what has gone before. None of us makes pretense to himself of tranquil temper. There are no barefoot pleasures in these hobnailed times. The world is burning. It is burning. Flame is never subtle in its ways. It has a pattern all can recognize. We smell the smoke and feel the scorching air and see the embers snatched up by the winds and blown this way and that. But we are thankful. Thankful in this graceless year for the strong joy of the challenge, for defiance in the nostril and the weapon in the hand. Shall we despair who've suckled freedom on the brew of vintages of wrath? Shall we be thankless for the passions stirring in our blood, the love of country, of each spine of cactus and each particle of mist? Shall we be thankless for the way we walk, fearlessly not stealing glances backward, for the way we talk, for scorn and laughter and the clenching of the fist? Come, come, Americans, come now and praise the broken bread together and the fiddle, and the tilling of the land, the bellboy by the shoals, and Joe, the wild boy, getting married to Louise. Praise now October and the song of songs together. Praise the men who never shall forget. The steel mills working through the night, the rifle factory, the weapon in the hand. Arise now and give thanks where thanks are due. have been listening to Psalm for a Dark Year, a Thanksgiving ode written, directed, and produced by Norman Corwin as program number 26 in the Columbia Workshop special cycle, 26 by Corwin. The musical score was composed and conducted by Alexander Semler. The principal narration was done by Mr. Corwin. Others in the cast were Martin Gable, Parker Fenley, Anne Boley, Frank Lovejoy, Martin Wolfson, Hester Sundergaard, Sidney Smith, Gene Allen, Ian Martin, and Charles Carroll. In closing 26 by Corwin, we present Davidson Taylor, who resumes next week as producer of the Columbia Workshop. Tonight we have heard the last broadcast in what has been, even for the Columbia Workshop, a most unusual series. 26 shows written, directed, and produced by one man. The Columbia Network is proud not only of 26 by Corwin but also of other such landmarks in radio drama as seems radio's here to stay, they fly through the air, and the plot to overthrow Christmas, all by Corwin. Most of us remember when Norman Corwin's name was new to the workshop. It is one of the workshop's jobs to find new talents and give them proper hearings. During the coming weeks, we shall hear the work of a number of new writers, and we are excited, frankly, about the quality and variety of their scripts. We have in store for you... A regional show, a satire, a farce, a document, a fantasy, an opera, and a melodrama which belong in workshop company. Every Sunday at this time, we invite you to share the pleasures of discovery with us. We'll try to go on doing what the workshop has attempted ever since the first broadcast on July 18th, 1936. We'll try to bring you every week something you could have heard nowhere else in radio.
This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Columbia Workshop presents number 14 of 26 by Corwin. Samson, a new verse play by Norman Corwin, starring Mady Christians and Martin Gable, with an original musical score composed and conducted by Bernard Herman. Tonight's drama, the first of the Old Testament trilogy, which will include Esther and Job, is based on chapter 13 of the book of Judges, verses 18 through 30. on the face he wears at night. He smiles like a thumb-sucking babe and turns a half-turn in his love crib. Sleep is good news to bone and sinew. Therefore to Samson, who is bone and sinew, therefore he smiles. Sleep, Samson. Sleep, your gift at sleep. Each plodding breath a bellows to the forge. This deep indwelling strength is not a thing of body juices or of blood springs, but of raw hair, lank hair, lank common hair, bewitched by some black god of Israel. Knowing this secret, I am stronger than your cudgel fist. Your wrist of granite. Where is the man in all Philistia can undo such a might and main? A thousand warriors lie broken in the clay at Lehi, dead of trying Samson's metal. He smote them as a mower smites the grain, a very mortal sight. And still he lives among them, quite unconquered. However, what cannot be Conquered can be coaxed. The cobra may be sung to sleep. The leopard fanned and petted. Whatever fury's armor cannot fend, softness will soon enough devour. I will awaken Samson to a riddle. What is it that is lighter than a dust mote to the touch, yet crushing as disaster? The answer, any moment of the day, the feather strokes of time, the soft-faced little seconds do hammer down the mighty and stoop mountains under and trample out the fires of the fiercest stars. This much a woman knows of stratagem. The unsheathed breast is keener than the naked sword. They have come. The Lord, I hear. Less signaling or you are piping your own funeral. Is he asleep, Delilah? Yes. Come quietly. How many are you? Seven. You brought the razor to shave off his head? Yes. The money also? Each of us, eleven hundred silver pieces. Samson wakes and discovers we are all conspirators. Your wives will waken and discover they are widows. Who will shave Samson's head? The lightest finger of you. Of us? Who else, then? I? My bargain was to hound my lover's genius to its lair, but not to beard it. 
That is up to you, brave lords. Here is the silver. Put it over there. Well, come now. Who will shear my lion so he be your lamb? What? None of you? <laughs> the seven highest lords of the land and all at sea? I will shave, Samson. You? It will make me worthy in the eyes of our great god Dagon. Delilah! Why, you... Delilah, where are you? Quick, quick, get away, get away. Be quiet, quiet. quick. Do not move. I'll go into him. I am here, Samson. When you hear me hum to him, it will be safe for you to steal into the chamber. Not before. Why did you leave me? I got up to watch the full moon, Wester. Never has a valley been so drugged and scented and serene. Don't leave me in the night, Delilah. While you were gone, I staggered sick and sweating in a festal dream whose shape already fades. I reached my arms out to you as if to save myself from drowning in a sea of octopi and fanged eels. But you were nowhere. Hey. There, my poor, beleaguered boy, there, there. A kiss for Samson's brow. Now hold me softly in the arms that terrify the world. Delilah. Never will you be alone again on your love bed. Dear mighty man, so unafraid to stand alone against a thousand enemies. I will watch over you. And it accept all shadows as suspicion of unwholesomeness. No terrors stalk the earth so leering and so leprous and invincible with evil as the undredged demons of our dreams. Give over now. Rest now. Fantasy is ruptured. Lie easy in my arms. Here. Pillow your head against my knees. And sleep. My strong heart, sleep, beloved, sleep, my hero, sleep. The wars are over, aren't they? Yes, the wars are over. Put by as penitents put by their sins. Put by, put by. No more the bleeding bowel and the broken back, the eggshell skull staved in. No, no more. Ah, peace is a nice sentiment. It is. A shield hung up forever on the wall. Yes. And a fat fawn browsing in a wolf proof meadow. A wound sponged clean and healing under balms and unguents. <laughs> Rest your weary head. There. There. Now go to sleep. Delilah. Samson. Samson. can't see you. Where are you, Delilah? Oh, that's set. We need a light. Light your candles. I will shield his eyes. I have the razor. I am ready. Then begin. One lock is shaven. Six locks more. Two. Five more. Three. Four. Four. Hold on. He says. Now then, the remainder. Five. 
sticks. He bubbles at the mouth in some deep, sudsy slumber. Just one lock more. And he is shorn for good. Seven. Finished. All but finished. Now it commences. First. Clear away this fury-making hair. Done. Now make a wider light. Yeah. He's turning. He is still asleep. Now, are you ready with your ropes? Primed and waiting. Stand back. I will awaken him. Samson! The Philistines are on you, Samson. Mm-hmm. What is this? Who are these men, Delilah? The Philistines are on you, Samson! No, no, this is another dream. My head! Loose his hands! And let him feel his scalp! Sean. Sean of my secret and my strength! I sold your strength for silver! No! Let me shake my head till I am sensible again. I still am in sessions of a dream. This is a tableau out of sleep. This cannot be Delilah, but a counterfeit! It can be! And it is! No, no! This is a play of ghastliness, goaded by some dead lover's mold green envy. My senses do this treason. Not Delilah. Oh, my head needs shaking to be clear. Then uh, let the hand of a Philistine hasten to assist you. (laughs) (laughs) Ah, he is human and responsive, too. For see, he's bleeding where I hit him in the mouth. Now he begins to know the taste of insult. I am awake, then. This is a conscious and malignant thing. Betrayed and trapped and bound with rope enough to tie the sun from rising. Now that you have taken Samson, take him and go. This has been a sleepless night. The first of many for you. May your sleep be rotted to the core forever. Plagued and pursued across the face of night and cancerous with conscience. Keep your curses and reproaches in your cheek. I've done what I have done, and I am quit of it. And none of your vile maledictions can corrupt me. Alas, you're right. Corruption cannot be corrupted any more than truth can be made still truer, or perfection be perfected. How can a soul decayed as yours rot further? Hold on! For words are all the strength you have left to you now. Samson, you, whom I have hated while I loved, brood over this. You have been vanquished not by soldiers milling in a bloody mud, but by a woman, quietly, alert, unarmed, companionless, inspired not by fearsome shouts of battle, but by silver! Silver, yes, properly. Tribute paid to the conqueror for conquering. Death is a greater conqueror than even you, Delilah. Also quiet and alert, unarmed and unaccompanied. What tribute shall you pay the grave? When angry justice overtakes you, with what coin bribe the worm? With flesh. It can be minted and it can be forged into a hot and supple metal. My body is the sword that cuts you down. Mm. And a two-faced sword it is, drawn from a scabbard of the foulest treachery and thrust into the vitals of a trusting sleeper for a sack of silver. Oh, Felicia! You are my people's enemy and you are mine. And you are captured like a common thief. By a common lying hypocrite. The vanquished would do better not to sneer at the victorious. Yes, truthful Delilah is our greatest army. We should drink to us. Toast to victory! Yes. To victory! Yes. 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 and degenerate yes. victory. Yes. Oh, crass, craven Philistia. All war debauched and honor shamed away. Fly skirts for banners. Lisp your commands. Ride beds to battle. Flank with a thigh. Better than bungling among broken backs and shattered skulls. Listen, the eight of you. I am the sex which fathers so deplore at birth and glumly suffer to be reared. A girl is born, they say. Alas, the pity, luck, and Dagon have deserted you. A girl is born, fit only to attend the wants of masters and to sate their several hungers. We are the weak ones, 
The veiled ones. We are the women, the opinionless, consulted only by our lovers and our suckling babes. Here is example of our uselessness. This brutish Israelite who in a single brawl at Ashkelon killed 30 men, who out of fury when he was denied a wife, burnt down the cornfields and the vineyards in the time of harvest. This terrifying Samson who one rowdy midnight wrecked the city gate of Gaza, carried it away upon his shoulders, who at Lehi slew a thousand of our fighting men armed only with the jawbone of an ass. This same appalling Samson lies disfranchised here by one such weak and useless and opinionless. A girl child, much deplored at birth. Consider it, my lords and masters. You, whom I hate together as I hate all men. Consider it, my fallen lover. In the meantime, go. Go, take him, take yourself. Remove from here. This incident is ended. We are ready to proceed. Samson, now we shall do to you as you have done to us. Impossible. You cannot slay a thousand of me. No, but one can die a thousand deaths. <laughs> are you prepared then, Samson? For anything but justice. Ah, shall the strong man squeal when we begin? Shall Samson cry for mercy? You shall not have the pleasure. No, the pain! <laughs> I am far less a spectacle than you. A hundred smirking lords set round about a chained and bonded man to do him torture. These are the faces I've seen on bratty boys when picking off the wings of injured flies. Quiet, murderer, lest we root out your tongue. Root out my tongue, and still my thoughts shall speak. And when we hack your hands off, will you raise your stumps against them? Yeah! Yeah! Ah, but little men, to vaunt advantage and to sport in the discomfiture of the defeated, the lowest of low lusts is torment, for it lies beneath the bottom instinct of the savage animals. Wolves are more dignified. Snakes, by comparison, walk lofty. Yea, the crawling crab has wings. Not even the despised jackal would go for a side of skill. But do proceed, Philistine. There is merriment for such as you and such as me. Behold, my lords and lieges, here is lore of animals and of their instincts, told to us by kind old Samson. Ah, we are but schooling at his feet. Observe and listen. You will learn the tactics of the bees. How ants are provident. How bears deploy the winter. How the supine chrysalis grows wings. <laughs> Here is the second lesson, Samson. The great and powerful among the animals are short of sight. The whale who thrashes up a storm with but a flicker of his tail is squint-eyed. And the elephant whose legs are pillars left behind from the construction of the earth sees blurs beyond two lengths of its own self. Thus... To adjust sweet nature to its proper scale, your sight should be subtracted, since you are indeed a mighty animal. Or were one. <laughs> <laughs> Less vision, therefore, for a holder of outspoken views. This seer among us, this our honored guest, he will now subdivide his eyes. What? Leave him one eye? Indeed not. That would fracture all our delicate arithmetic. Two eyes are only twice one eye, but one eye is a billion more than none. Uh, <laughs> I have it. We shall multiply. Is this a riddle now? Sam, is fond of riddles. We shall multiply and not divide. Two eyes times ought. The sum is nothing. Nothing it shall be. Samson, have you ever seen a cipher close at hand? Appear into the depths of nothingness? Yes, I'm looking now into the endless vacancies of souls, each yawning like the ultimate abyss of hell. Remarkable, the penetration of his eyes. Hand me the red-hot iron. We will execute these scouts at once. Here is the brand. See how it glows, Samson? With this dull light, we shall extinguish light. Let's see you stare it down! I'm prepared. 
Come with your blazing iron. What will you do for eyes tomorrow, Samson? Have you thought of that? The God of Israel shall be my eyes. <laughs> Ready now? Hold him, lest he squirm inside his chain. We are holding him. Esther, a new biblical opera by Lynn Murray and Norman Corwin, presented as number 15 in the Columbia Workshop Cycle, 26 by Corwin, and featuring Martin Gable, Arnold Moore, Everett Sloan, Joan Vitez, and Winston O'Keefe. Now it came to pass, in the days of Ahasuerus, from India even unto Ethiopia, over an hundred and twenty and seven provinces. I do hereby proclaim this year of my reign, the biggest feast ever seen in the East. Six months we'll make merry and let workers stay alone and sing and dance and celebrate the glory of the throne. And there was a big feast in Shushan. When the heart of the king was merry with wine, and he was in his cups and he was feeling fine, four sheets to the wind and under the weather, he called his seven chamberlains together. Now, gentlemen, where's her imperial majesty? Queen Vashti. Vashti is giving a party in the royal house. For women only. Oh, yes. Well, bring her here to me. Yes, right away, your majesty. Yes, yes right, right away, your majesty. Yes, right away, your majesty. Now, Vashti, she was spirited and highly independent. A purple-blooded Persians, a proud descendant. Her bearing it was regal and her attitude was bold. And when the chamberlains arrived, her compliments were cold. What do you want? His Imperial Majesty requests the presence of Her Imperial Majesty at the feast in the garden of the court of the palace. Oh, he the... does, does he? Tell him I'm busy with my own guests. But, madam... Annoy me no further. I refuse to go with you. But, Your Highness... Did you hear me? Yes, yes, yes Your Imperial Majesty. Majesty. Very well. Now get out. Hey, you can. Yes, Your Majesty. You are reputed to be the sagest of the seven princes of Persia? Yes, Your Majesty. That is why I sent for you. I need your advice. Yes, Your Majesty. You are a very wise fellow, Memu Pen. If you can't advise me, who can? Nobody. The queen has disobeyed an imperial command. She has broken with tradition. She has gotten out of hand. So how am I to act now? What conclusions do you draw? What can we do unto the queen according to the law? Sire, in my opinion, Vashti the queen has wronged not only the king, but also the princes and all the people in the provinces. For this deed of the queen will be noised among the wives And they'll despise their husbands all the rest of their lives Likewise shall all the ladies scorn the princes of the sire I fear the low example will arouse contempt and ire What to do about it? Let a law be written by which Vashti might be smitten By the loss of her royal estate then choose another queen who is not for me. That's a fine that's great. 
scribe, take a decree. Yes, Your Majesty. I, Ahasuerus, decree that Queen Vashti shall be deprived of her royal estate for just and good causes, and that every man in my kingdom shall bear rule in his own house. And so the queen was divorced. And Ahasuerus was alone in the palace. And he was very lonely. What matters come? What matters glory? What matters riches of song and song? Matters my throne so long as I'm alone. Then said the king's servant that ministered unto him, Sire, we have a suggestion. What is it? Let the king appoint officers in all the provinces that they may gather together fair young maidens into Shushan the palace and let the maiden which the king be queen instead of Vashtar. Let it be done. What matters come? What matters glory? What matters love? Now in Shushan there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai. And he brought up Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother. And the maid was fair and beautiful. So it came to pass, when the king's commandment and his decree was heard, and when many maidens were gathered together unto Shushan the palace, that Esther was brought also unto the king's house. And Esther showed not her people or her kindred, for Mordecai had charged her that she should not show it. So Esther went into the royal house of Ahasuerus. What is your name? My name is Esther. It is a pretty name. Thank you, Your Majesty. And very becoming. Sit beside me, Esther. You're very beautiful. Of what family are you? A common family. My father was Abihail. And of what people are you? An ancient people. How ancient? Ancient as Persia. Esther, do you think you could love the emperor of 127 provinces, king of the Persians, king of the Medes? Yes. <laughs> but what do you know about love, little Esther?
loved Esther above all. And she obtained grace and favor in his sight. So that he set the royal crown upon her head. And made her queen instead of Vashti. Then came Haman. Haman was a wicked man. For all the servants in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman. For the king had promoted him above all the princes. Only Mordecai bowed not. And when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, he was full of wrath. Who is that dog of a dog who will not bow down to me? That, Your Excellency, is Mordecai, the Jew. All others bow to me. He alone remains standing in the gate. I'll see about that. You, Mordecai, down on your knees. Well, down, Jew. Haman has spoken. I bow only to God. Down, you fool. You've had my answer. You'll die for this cursed old man. Why do you refuse to bow, you swine? Uh, speak up, Greybeard. Answer the Grand Vizier. I will not bow down to a man on a horse. I will not bow down to a crown. I will never yield to a tyrant's force, though I burn or hang or drown. I will never worship a grand vizier or his sons or his nephews or nieces. There's only one rule whom I fear, though I be chopped in a thousand pieces. I will not kiss the earth that you have brought, though I be whipped all day for it. I will bow down only to the living God, so can't be the price I pay for it. Shall I arrest this man, Your Excellency? No, don't contaminate yourself. I have a better plan in mind for dealing with Mordecai and his kind. Come along, Captain. Scribe, come here. Yes, Your Excellency. Set this down. To the king's lieutenants and to the governors and the rulers of every people of every province, and order as follows. To destroy, to kill, to cause to perish all Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day. The day of the twelfth month, and to take the spoil of them for a prey. Very well. Inscribe this order immediately and return to me here. Thus shall I avenge the insult of Mordecai. He and his people shall perish as one. The best way to bolster authority is to bully a qualified lord in peace. I shall slay with the sword all those I hate. They'll gravel in the dust before Haman the great. On the scattered and the few will my wrath be heard. Then I'll seize the crown and conquer the world. I'll begin by making a scapegoat race and cut my throat. Look at my face. Oh, the best way to bolster authority is to bully a small kind of in peace. I'll rule with iron every Persian and me. I'll make them sweat and I'll make them bleed. With gross and poisonous lies, I'll feed him and hold in my grip a life and freedom. I'll begin by making a scapegoat race and kill them off without a trace. 
Listen. What are you doing inside the palace? You'll be killed if you're found here. That's why I must speak quickly. Did you get my message about Haman's decree to massacre the Jews? What to be done? Esther, you must go into the king and make supplication to him in behalf of your people. But don't you know the law? Whoever goes into the king without being called shall be put to death. Except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter. But I've not been called to come into the king for the past 30 days. Esther. Don't think that you shall escape in the king's house any more than the rest of your people. For if you altogether hold your peace now, then deliverance shall arise from another place. But you and your father's house shall be destroyed. Who knows but what you are come to the kingdom for just such a time as this. Very well. I will go unto the king, which is not according to law. And if I perish, I perish. Where are the proclamations awaiting my seal? Here, Your Majesty. Very well. And while I seal these with the King's ring, go tell Memukan, who stands with Haman, that I would have a word with him. Yes, sire. Your Excellency. Yes? His Majesty the King requests that you consult with him as soon Wait as... Wait a moment. I believe my eyes. Is that Queen Esther standing here in the court, though not called by the King? Why, this is a grave transgression of the law. Punishable by death, unless the King holds forth his scepter. Quiet, the King must be. Queen Esther. May it please the King. Come. Touch the scepter which I hold forth. My sire. What is your request, Queen Esther? If it please the king to grant my petition, let the king and Haman come tomorrow to a banquet which I've prepared for them. Is that all? <laughs> let it be done, Queen Esther, and let Haman be so advised. invited nobody to the banquet but myself and the king. Why, this is the greatest honor that has ever been bestowed upon any man in the kingdom. But it avails me nothing so long as I see Mordecai sitting at the king's gate. Mordecai, who will not bow down to me, though the rest of Shushan kiss the dirt under my feet. I believe I shall hang the knave. Hmm. I will build a gallows today, 50 cubits high, here before my own house, so that I may see it. And tomorrow I will petition the king that Mordecai be hanged. Yes. But first to build the gallows. On that night, the king could not sleep. And he commanded to bring the books of the records of the Chronicles. And they were read before the king. In the eighth year of the reign of Ahasuerus, two of the king's chamberlains sought to lay hands upon the king to murder him. But the thing was known to a man named Mordecai who told it to the officers of the king. And when inquisition was made of the matter, it was found out, and therefore the criminals were hanged. And on the eighth day... Just a moment. I don't even remember this thing. What honor has been done Mordecai for making known the plot against me? Nothing was done for him. Nothing? Hmm. Who's in the court right now? Haman, to petition the king concerning the hanging of a citizen of Shushan. Tell him to come in. Yes, your majesty. 
And unkindness has been done unto Mordecai. His service to the throne should have been acknowledged long before this. But for his vigilance, I might be dead. May it please the king, the grand vizier. Haman, a question. Ah, uh, yes, your majesty. What shall be done to a man whom the king delights to honor? A man whom the king delights to honor. For the man whom the king delights to honor will um, bring the royal apparel which the king wears, and the horse which the king rides, and the crown which is set upon his head. Let one of the king's most noble princes array the man withal, and bring him on horseback through the city, and proclaim before him, Thus shall it be done. The man whom the king delights to honor. Very good, Haman. Now make haste and take the apparel and the horse as you have suggested, and do so to Mordecai, who sits at the gate. Don't overlook anything you've suggested. So Haman had to honor Mordecai according to his own device. And after that, he went to the banquet with the king and Esther the queen. <laughs> now, what is the petition you saved up for this banquet, Queen Esther? If I found favor in your sight, and if I pleased the king... Yes? Then spare my life, and spare my people. Spare your life? Your people? What do you mean, Queen Esther? We are sold, I and my people. Sold? By what enemy of the king would kill the queen? Who is he and where is he that dares presume in his heart to do so? He is with us. And his name is Haman. He has issued a decree to massacre the Jews who are my people. No, no, it is not the I. The adversary and the enemy. It is this very man. Haman, have you perverted the command I entrusted unto you because I believed in the wisdom of your counsel? No, Your Majesty. I, uh, allow me to, to explain. Why do you stammer so? The matter is not what it seems, Your Majesty. I have rung for the Chamberlain Harbona. We will make inquisition whether you lie against the word of the Queen. But, Your Majesty, if it please the King, I... It, it Harbona, not... apprehend this man has conspired to destroy the queen and her people. I am innocent of this. Bear witness for me, Chamberlain. What do you know of this, Harbona? I know only that the Grand Vizier has lately built a gallow 50 cubits high for Mordecai. For oh, Mordecai? Where is this gallows that would prove enough? It stands in the house of Haman. Is that so, Haman? Uh, yes, but you see, it was... A Harbona! Let it be written to reverse the letters devised by Haman to destroy these people. Your Majesty! Let it be granted that these people gather themselves together and stand for their life to destroy those who attack them on the 13th day of the 12th month. Let it be known that they should be ready on that day to avenge themselves on their enemies. Yes, Your Majesty. And as for Haman, take him away. Cover up his face and hang him on the gallows he prepared in his house. No! No, Your Majesty, no! No! <laughs> Haman stood upon the gallows. Haman stood upon the gallows. He built in his own house. Where was to hang for his And they hanged Haman on the gallows. <laughs> Be a lesson to vain men who lust for limitless power. Let this notify profane men that there comes a reckoning hour. Let this point a moral that the only truce with a traitor and tyrant is a gallows noose. <laughs> This be a lesson to great men who rule and command and lead. Never trust in men who hate men because of their race or creed. Let this point a moral that the only truth with a bully and a bigot is a gallows noose. Let 
took off his ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai. And as to the queen and joined her people to establish among them the month which was turned unto them from morning into a good day, that they should make days of feasting and joy. All these acts, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Medea and Persia? That was Esther, a new opera by Lynn Murray and Norman Corwin, presented as the second in the Old Testament trilogy. The role of Esther was sung by Genevieve Rowe, that of Ahasuerus by Harrison Knox, Mordecai by Eugene Lowenthal, and Haman by Kenneth Schoen. Next week at this same time, Columbia will present Charles Lawton in a literal adaptation of the Book of Job as the last of the Old Testament trilogy, for which production Dean Taylor has composed a special score, his first for radio. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. From Hollywood tonight, Columbia is privileged to present the eminent actor Charles Lawton and the music of Deems Taylor in a performance of the biblical Book of Job, adapted and directed by Norman Corwin. Leif Stevens conducts the orchestra. Charles Lawton in Job. <laughs> perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance was also seven thousand sheep, and three thousand camels, and five hundred yoke of oxen, and a very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all men of the East. And his sons went and feasted in their houses, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And when the days of their feasting were gone about, Job sanctified them, and rose up early in the morning, and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. Thus Job did continually.
Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said to Satan, Whence comest thou? From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that fears God and eschews evil? Does Job fear God for naught? Have you not made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth your hand now and touch all that he has and he will curse you to your faith. Behold, all that he has is in your power only upon himself. Put not forth your hand. And there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said... The oxen were plowing, and the asses feeding beside them. And the Sabians fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness. And it smote the four corners of the house. And it fell upon the young men, and they're dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell them. and rent his mantle and fell down upon the ground and worshipped. Naked came I out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Again there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them to present himself. And the Lord said to Satan, From whence cometh thou? From going to and fro in the earth, and walking up and down in it. Have you considered, my servant Job, that still he holds fast his integrity, although you moved me against him? To destroy him without cause. Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath he will give for his life. But put forth your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy faith. Behold, he is in your hand, but save his life. went Satan forth, and smote Job with sore boils, from the sole of his foot unto his crown. Now when Job's three friends heard all this, they came, every one from his own place, Eliphaz and Bildad and Zophar. So they sat down with him upon the ground seven days and seven nights, and none spake a word to him, for they saw that his grief was very great. After this opened Job his mouth 
and cursed his day. Let the day perish wherein I was born, and the night in which it was said there is a man-child conceived. Let that day be darkness. Let it not be joined unto the days of the year. Lo, let that night be solitary. Let no joyful voice come therein. Let them curse it that curse the day who are ready to raise up their morning. Why died I not from the womb? For now should I have lain still and... Of course I'm not kidding. You mean to tell me you have women and anti-aircraft batteries? Hundreds of them. Are there any jobs in Britain women don't do? Why, in some of the steel mills up north, women are loading pig iron and shoveling coke. They also mix cement and they do welding in shipyards. I suppose they announce your radio programs, too. Announce? They not only announce, they engineer programs here. Is that okay, engineer? Okay, good test. We're getting the feedback okay. Quality merit three plus. Go ahead. Columbia Broadcasting System presents An American in England, the fourth of a series of six programs written and directed by Norman Corwin, produced by Edward R. Murrow, and broadcast from somewhere in the British Isles. Joseph Julian narrates, and the original musical score is by Benjamin Britton. Tonight, Women of Britain. of a West End hotel and look down toward the crowded ballroom. It's very lively. Dancing is on full tilt. There's a dazzle of beautiful women in evening gowns and officers in the uniforms of half a dozen allies. It's all so gay you'd hardly think that there's a shooting war 80 miles away in the channel tonight. You move up from the ballroom toward the main entrance. The lighting is dim conserving electricity to save fuel. Suddenly, out of the haze, a magnificent number in a fur wrap swirls past you, leaving eddies of perfume in her wake. You take a deep breath. Good evening, sir. Shall I call a taxi? No, thanks. Just going for a walk. Very good, sir. That was the doorman. You go past him, through the revolving door, and step out into the night. Not so black as it was last week. The moon's just coming up. You can see the Great Dipper behind the chimney pots of Maiden Lane. For a moment, you stand in the entrance, studying the sky. Ronnie, wait for John. Is is that you, Ronnie? I'm afraid not, ma'am. Oh, I beg your pardon. I thought you were someone else. It's so dark here. That's quite all right. Another good looker. Through these portals, past the most beautiful girls in London, apparently. Oh, well. You shove off into the moonlit night of the Strand and Fleet Street and walk east at a slow, philosophic pace. You walk down to a part of the city called, of all things, the city. Staggering desolation here. Acre after acre of bomb ruins. Like the pictures of frontline towns in the last war. In the hush of the blackout, amid the moonlit ruins, you find yourself thinking about those glittering and exotic women you just saw in the fancy hotel. And you wonder, feeling a little lonely perhaps, about women in general, about the women of Britain in particular. You wonder what the war has done to them. Not much to judge by those you've just seen. But then you remember what a young RAF pilot told you the day you arrived. Don't judge us by the lobbies of a few hotels in London. See us as we are. That stops you in your tracks. 
course. See them as they are. Judging anything about England from a big hotel lobby is like judging the United States from a movie. That ought to be plain enough to anybody. And yet you find yourself all tied up with romantic notions. A line keeps running through your head. She walks in beauty like the night. She walks in beauty like the night. She walks in beauty... Wait a minute. What kind of sentimental slosh is that? The woman of Britain walks in battle dress and does fire guard duty in the night. Exotic women. You walk a little more briskly. Tomorrow you'll do some serious looking around. There must be a good story in the women of Britain. You'll find out. Yes, sir. So you take a bus back to the hotel. The conductor is a pint-sized little Scotch girl wearing a gray smock. Stairs, please. Clear to. Strand. Toppins, please. Thank you. Uh, tell me. Are there many women conductors on buses? 7,000 in London alone. 7,000? Yes, sir. Ludgate Circus. She goes off about her work, climbing to the top deck for fares. Somewhere tonight, in Australia, Madagascar, Malta maybe, there's a British soldier who used to punch tickets on this bus. Releasing manpower, they call it. You ride along... Looking idly at the advertising signs inside the bus. You hardly read them in the dim light. One is a jingle advising people how to hail a bus in the blackout. Face the driver, raise your hand. You'll find that he will understand. But some wag is written in pencil underneath. I know he'll understand the cuss. The point is, will he stop the bus? Well, you're at the strand. That's your stop. You get out, cross the street... Swish through the revolving doors and are back in your hotel again. And on your way through the lobby, who do you suppose passes you? Helen of Troy. Hmm. And then a blonde looking like Lana Turner on the arm of a naval officer. Well, say like here. You go up to your room, kick off your shoes plunk yourself down in a chair, light a cigarette, and you pick up the morning paper, which you haven't read yet. The front page is covered with notices. You read some of them. Warren, to my dearly beloved boy, Donald H. Warren, fighter pilot RAF. On this, your 21st birthday. Reported killed in action, October the 13th, 1941. Sadly missed. Mother. Cranston. Believed a prisoner of war. Now known killed in action in Malaya. On January 11, 1942. Captain J.L.W. Cranston. Most dearly loved husband of Josephine and darling daddy of Ellen and Hope of Hatfield House, New Malden, Surrey. The widowed and bereaved left behind to mourn. That's the way it's been with women since war immemorial, hasn't it? Until this war, something new has been added to this one. They don't stay at home and mourn anymore. Every home in Britain is a front line. Mother Warren's working in a canteen somewhere. Mrs. Cranston's making shells in a night shift. It's different this time. 7,000 bus conductors, women loading pig iron and steel mills, mixed ack-ack batteries. Yes, sir, it's different this time. Well, tomorrow you'll do some serious looking around. There must be a good story in the women of Britain. You go to bed. It's a 
a beautiful August morning. And you see by the papers that while you were enjoying your blackout walk last night, the RAF plastered another Nazi city. American Marines attacked in the Pacific. The Chinese recaptured a port. The Red Army smashed six attacks before Stalingrad. Also, tucked away at the bottom of page two, three girls on fire duty were killed in a raid on a small village in East Anglia. With news like that, it seems a small matter to have run out of clean shirts, but still it annoys you when you ring for the maid. Uh, did you ring, sir? Yes. My laundry should have been picked up four days ago, and it's still here. Oh, I'll take it right away. I sir. told the other maid to be sure and send it out Wednesday so I can have it back by today. Oh, she was called up, you know. She must have forgot about your laundry. She was called up for what? A conscription, sir, to work in a munitions factory. I'm taking her place. Oh, I see. Yes, we older women are taking over a good many jobs. Hmm. Now, tell me... How do women here feel about conscription? Well, good, of course. They want to help. I wish I were younger so I could do something for the war. Well, you are helping in a way, aren't you? I mean, by replacing women who are replacing men. Yes, but that's so far off, if you know what I mean. It's, um, well, it's so, uh, it's... Uh, Indirect? Yes. Yes, indirect, that's it. Oh, I don't know. Are there any women slackers? Bound to be some, you know. They try all kinds of ways to get around the call, you know. They try to make themselves look very busy and important, doing nothing, if you ask me. Hmm. Uh, is there much complacency? Uh, what's that mean, sir? Oh, easy going. As though the war didn't matter much. Oh, certainly. Some are like that. In fact, too many, if you ask me. Well, you know what a woman said to my sister last week? She said, I'm having such trouble getting a maid because all my maids keep getting called up. So I'll be glad when this war's over, she said, because after the war, there'll be lots of unemployment and good maids will be plentiful and cheap. What did your sister tell that woman? Well, my sister said to her, you have another guest come in, ma'am. That's what she said right to her face. Mm. What else did she say? She said, this war ain't being fought to make maids plentiful and cheap. She said, this war ain't being fought to make the world safe for unemployment. Just the opposite. She talked right up. She did. Oh, my sister can be a terror, you know. Of course, she's younger than me. Well, what did the woman say to that? Uh, uh, she didn't say anything, I don't think. Yeah. Well, you tell your sister I think she's right. I will, sir. Dead right. Yes, sir, thank you. I'll, uh, I'll tell her. I'll take the laundry now. She takes the laundry. And you take your hat and coat and set out on your grand tour of investigation. <laughs> Within 50 yards, you note a half a dozen items having to do with the case. Every fifth woman on the street is in uniform. Wafts, hats, wrens, Canadians, Americans, New Zealanders, nurses, ambulance drivers. You turn into Charing Cross Road and see two women in dirty slacks cleaning traffic standards. And further down, a girl lifting a crate off the back of a wagon. You have an impulse to run over and give her a hand. But you'd probably be insulted. You'd only make yourself ridiculous. You go into the underground, subway to you, and descend a long flight of stairs. And then you go down a very long and very steep escalator. You've never been as far down in the earth as this in your life. There's still another bank of escalators. Now, the station guard in gray slacks and a peaked cap announces the next train. Walker train, Baker Street, Paddington, Walker train. The train rolls in. It seems massive after the subway trains of Boston, New York, and Philadelphia. Very handsomely upholstered and comfortable. And it goes like a bat out of a tube station. <laughs> On 
On the train, you fall to talking with a man about women. He says they're all over the place. Oh, yes. They're all over the place. You ought to go to a farm and see what the land army is doing. What's the land army? Volunteer farm workers. Women taking the place of men in the fields. What do they do? Oh, they do everything. Plow, plant, gather harvest. They live on the farms. Well, is this land army an organized affair or is it just... Oh, absolutely. Nothing random about it. It's important work and tough work. Some of the land army girls have been awarded decorations by the government. For big crops? No, for carrying on their work under bombings. Women are no small factor in this season's bumper crop, you know. Biggest crop in the history of the country this summer. You leave your friend and come up into the bright day. Around the corner, a group of girls are drilling. Right in the middle of a London street. Arms swinging, heads up. Deadly serious. Not a giggle and a gaggle. You walk down the street and head for Paddington Station where you'll take the train that will take you to the bus that will take you to your first factory. Women who work 10 hours a day making weapons for soldiers who may have to fight 24 hours a day don't have much time to talk to visitors. The girl who pickles coils of wire in hydrochloric acid looks up long enough to answer a question. No, I've got no complaint. I don't mind being conscripted, and I don't mind being away from home. That's the least I can do for the war. I don't mind putting these things in and pulling them out all day long. But what irritates me is that we women aren't getting the same pay as the men for the same amount of work. Equal pay for equal work. That's what Lloyd George says, and that's what I say. She lifts another heavy coil and goes on. Now, you take in the fire services. If a man is injured, he gets 35 bob a week. But if a girl gets hurt, she gets only 28. Does that mean women are worth less than men as human beings? She dunks the coil extra hard, and you get a strong whiff of acid. An airplane factory. Women making planes from nose to tail. A great long shed like some of the American factories. Noisier than... Transatlantic static on a bad night. A riveter stops long enough to explain that things are a little better now. It's easier now. At first, it was very hard on us shopping girls, because we were expected to shop in the lunch hour, and that meant either not having the proper lunch or not shopping properly. Well, what's been done to correct that? Well, the factory's given us priority cards. That means when we go into a store, we get attended before those who aren't working. I can see that makes sense. Well, then also there's the good neighbor system. Good neighbors? What's that? Well, that's when we get together and take turns shopping for each other. One might do the shopping for four or five. Collective security, huh? (laughs) Yes, collective security. You speak to the manager of a tank factory. They employ women crane operators, cable assemblers, welders, millers, and even have them run the big hydraulic presses. You ask the boss how women compare with men on these jobs. Well, in my experience, they're often superior. Often as not. Wouldn't you say so, J.M.? Quite. I think also that married women seem especially eager to do the job and to keep at it. It's almost as though they were carrying their household pride into the factory. In a factory that makes insulated cables... You talk with a woman who handled hot copper ingots weighing 70 pounds off a conveyor. She's glad to be contributing to the war effort, but she has some criticism of methods of conscription. In my opinion, there's not enough careful grading and selection in the conscription of women. They're treated too much like... like automatons, and too often they're not given the jobs they're best able to do. There should be better testing and grading of conscripts so that the right woman is in the right job. In a marine boiler shop, you lunch with grimy welders, cutters, grinders, and drillers, two-thirds of them women. The canteen is bustling, and over the loudspeaker following the one o'clock news, 
There's a talk by a woman member of Parliament, Miss Ellen Wilkinson. You recall her from the days when Hitler, Mussolini, and Franco attacked Spain. Miss Wilkinson was fighting fascism when a good many respectable people were still doing business with Hitler. But her talk today concerns the new compulsory fire watching for British women. The workers listen attentively. There will be a satisfaction later on in looking back and saying to oneself that it wasn't only the Russian women who stood in the hot spots and did their stuff. After the last war, children asked, What did you do in the Great War, Daddy? Well, after this one, there will be millions of children who will ask, What did you do in the Great War, Mommy? Or, for that matter, Granny. It will be pleasant to be able to say, Oh, nothing much. I just helped to beat the Luftwaffe. You take your ministry pass in hand and set out for a training camp of the ATS, Auxiliary Territorial Service. That's the woman's branch of the Army. You find it bristling with activity. Girls marching, drilling, riding bicycles, driving trucks, going about their chores with a snap and precision. There's a feeling of high morale and good discipline, a healthy tone in the way the girls salute their officers. You meet the chief commander and remark on the fine carriage of her troops. Yes, they're fine girls. The month they spend here makes quite a difference to them. It does, huh? Rather. Let me show you what I mean. She takes you to a nearby receiving station where 20 new recruits still wearing civvies stand in line to get khaki uniforms and supply kits. Hmm. A scragglier looking bunch of girls you never saw. Many are pale. All have poor posture. Some are depressed. You walk away with a commander. And as you round the corner, a squad of girls passes. Eyes right. They're spruce, confident. Their complexions are ruddy. Each looks twice as rugged as any of the rookies you just saw. Well, they're the same girls. Four weeks different. That's all. I suppose that for a good many of them, this is the first time in their lives that they've been given any kind of a break in the way of nourishment and physical training. Good, healthy, outdoor living. To say nothing of dental work and even hairdressing. What about such matters as makeup and hairdo? Makeup is all right, in moderation. We discourage it only if it becomes too conspicuous. Mm Mm-hmm. A commander. I wonder if you could tell me something about the uh, thinking of these girls. Have they any interest in the issues of the war? In what comes out of the victory? I mean, are they at least concerned with their own futures? Well... You see... Her face clouds. No longer the cheery optimism. The answer is no. The majority is concerned with day-to-day duties, which they perform very well. They don't have much of an impression about how this war started, beyond the fact that Hitler had a lot to do with it. The peace after victory occupies very little of their minds. That's too bad. Of course, we give them lectures on current events, but there's quite a handicap to overcome. You mean some of these women don't know the meaning of names like, let's say, uh, Vichy or Pearl Harbor or Suez? Oh, most of them don't know the names of half the countries in the war. Some of them couldn't point out Australia on a map. Oh, now, wait a minute, Commander. You're joking, aren't you? I'm afraid not, sir. Here, let me show you. Quite at random. Corporal, will you come over here? Ask her about the war. Yes, Commander? This gentleman wants to ask you some questions. Uh, what does the name Libya mean to you? Libya? I don't know. Uh, What's happening in the Caucasus right now? I don't know what Caucasus is. Did you ever hear of Malaya? No, sir. Cairo? Oh, yes, sir. Cairo. I've heard of Cairo. What do you know about it? Why, that's where my Harry is. I see. Thank you very much. Thank you, Corporal. That's all. Very disillusioning, isn't it? Yes. I'm afraid that England, for all its far-flung empire, has been a very insular country. At least up to now. You know the classic example of our insularity, don't you? No, what's that? 
There was once a headline in a London paper reading, Dense Fog in the Channel, Continent Cut Off from England. The talk goes on through tea, served in the officer's mess. And then you say goodbye to the commander and set out for a distant anti-aircraft training ground, where you're going to see the work of mixed ACK-ACK batteries. You travel by train, by bus, by taxi. You arrive. That's the target practice. You show papers. You meet the captain. He's a courteous, serious young man. I gather you would like to see the girls at work. Yes, sir, if you don't mind. I'm very glad to show you. If there ever was a doubt about women as efficient workers, this would dispel it. A team of spotters, predictors, height finders, 18 in all, move with the precision of a Swiss watch as they turn with a machinery following a plane. They look like a keen lot, Captain. They are. They're very good. But what were these girls before the war? Oh, one was a theater usher, another was a stenographer. They all volunteered for the job, huh? Oh, yes. All work for the women in connection with the operation of lethal weapons must be volunteered for. Mm-hmm. Do they like... Hey, that shot hit the cable towing the target, didn't it? <laughs> yes, that was a good shot. They do that every once in a while. We'll have to send up another target now. During the lull in the firing, you talk about your experiences with the corporal of the ATS and repeat what her commander said about the girls. The captain knocks the ashes out of his pipe then gazes off toward the horizon. Yes, I know. Not many of these girls understand or care, especially about the terms of the Atlantic Charter, if that's what you mean. It's not their fault. And it's not any lack of intelligence, either. They've just never been told. They've lived in a pretty narrow world, you know. Lived in a world whose chief interests were getting boyfriends, getting married and having babies. They were never taught the connection between bombs on Barcelona and bombs on Coventry. They haven't been encouraged to understand that a dead Chinese soldier is a dead Tommy under another name. Nobody has bothered to explain to them that the continent isn't cut off from England, as your story goes, by a fog in the channel. And they're only beginning to learn for themselves that no land is cut off from any other land anywhere. That freedom is absolutely indivisible. Well, aren't you really saying that it's a matter of education? That the solution is... It's a deep, far-reaching thing, having to do with education and experience and a kind of slow revolution in the thinking of women. A sort of emancipation, if you will. I believe it's happening. Women are coming into their own. They're sharing this scrap as they've never shared anything before. The women of Britain are not enduring war. They're fighting it, as you can see for yourself. And I dare say they're learning You really think they are? Oh, certainly. Before this war's over, they'll know we're more than Cairo. And they'll know that what goes on in Australia and China and all those other places has everything to do with their boyfriends and their husbands and their babies. Sure, they're learning. Learning learning first what they're capable of doing and how to do it. Learning that they're not just homemakers, but makers of the destinies of nations. That would be nice to believe. Three years ago, British girls were shocked at the idea of Russian girls becoming sea captains and flying officers. Today, these girls are shocked no longer. They're ready to grant that women are responsible and capable, and that women have what it takes to share and collaborate in the great work of the world. That's a goal for a girl, don't you think? Yes, I should think so. I say, will you excuse me, sir? The gun position officer is signaling. Certainly. He strides over to the guns. You stand alone, watching the girls do their stuff. And it strikes you that these girls, these women of Britain, so keen, so concentrated on their work, have got their eyes fixed on more than one target. Perhaps they're training their guns on an objective greater than they know.
You have been listening to Women of Britain, the fourth of a limited series of six programs under the title of An American in England, written and directed by Norman Corwin and brought to you by Columbia Broadcasting System direct from England through the facilities of the British Broadcasting Corporation. Joseph Julian narrated, and the original musical score was composed by Benjamin Britten and performed by the Orchestra of the Royal Air Force under the baton of Wing Commander R.P. O'Donnell. The program was produced by Edward R. Murrow. Your announcer was John Snag. This is ChestertonRadio.com. Good evening, this is Orson Welles, your producer of a special series of broadcasts presented by the makers of Tab's Blue Ribbon, the Mercury Summer Theater of the Air. Tonight, and every Friday night, Tab's Blue Ribbon presents you with a front row seat in America's favorite summer theater. And now, here's America's most famous producer, writer, director, Orson Welles. You might say that the following half hour and shivers, arranged for your delectation by Mr. Norman Corwin, is a radio documentary. Here is an authentic word-for-word confession of a murder committed by a middle-aged Englishman named Dougal some 41 years ago. Except for occasional dialogue indicated in the confession itself, we're bringing you over these microphones exactly what the killer told the British police exactly as it came out of his own tortured mind and in his very own words. So that this special broadcast may move without interruption, our sponsors have kindly omitted their commercial message at the time, uh, which usually comes in the middle break. So right now, before we get started, let's pause for a few seconds to do homage to a very patient and long-suffering gentleman, your dealer of blended, splendid, yes, your Pat's Blue Ribbon dealer deserves sympathy these days of the beer shortage. For after all, it's not much fun for him to have to tell you thirsty folks that he can't let you have all the past blue ribbon you'd like. So, please remember two things. First, remember he's doing his very best, as are we, to get you your share of Pap's blue ribbon. And second, remember that every single bottle you do get will be, as always, the happy blending of never less than 33 fine brews. Yes, as always... Every taste is just the way you want it. Not too heavy, not too light, with that real beer flavor coming through. As always, it's blended splendid, perhaps blue ribbon. And now, the Mercury brings you Orson Welles in his own production of Norman Corwin's The Moat Farm Murder. <laughs> And now, if the stenographer is ready, we will proceed with Mr. Dougal's confession from where he left off in our last session. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Dougal. Well, I did not find this Holland as generous as I expected. As I didn't have very much money, I suggested we should buy a farm. I think we looked at about a dozen farms altogether, but none of them suited me. So I came across the Moat House farm. It was just the place I wanted, and when she complained of its loneliness, I said that was its charm. Because we should be able to live there together away from any inquisitive strangers. Everything went all right up the time that the farm was purchased, and I certainly did intend that the deed should be made out in my name, but to this, Miss Holland would not consent. Now, would she pay the deposit in my name, and therefore all the visions I'd had of getting hold of the farm, turning it out, and selling it, melted away? Finding she was so tight fisted, I began to think of various schemes to put her out of the way. But I, I thought I'd wait a little bit to see if she altered. I think she was naturally very mean. Strange to find a woman so mean because otherwise she was not so bad. She'd often try when I was miserable or down in the dumps, cheer me up by playing or singing to me. And then she was rather snappy at times, and if I didn't quite agree with everything she said, she'd bounce out of the room, and then perhaps towards the evening she'd get over her temper and she'd come downstairs and plead for forgiveness. Herbert. What is it? I'm sorry about losing my temper. Well, are you now? I'm afraid I was sharper than I need have been. Do you forgive me? Why, yes, Cecile. Just so long as you realize that I was right in the matter. I suppose you were, Herbert. Well, I may forget it. 
It's only my state of nerves, really. Makes me give it way to such temper. I certainly thought she had more money than she did. And although we were such great friends, it... It's not without the greatest trouble that I got to know all about her financial position. I made up my mind at last to put her out of the way. I used to sit and think about it for hours because although I'd done a lot of things during my life, I, I couldn't quite make up my mind to go so far as to murder her. But when we actually moved into the farm, I definitely decided what I should do. I thought that a very good place to bury her would be the ditch. That was why the very first week we were at the farm, I gave orders for it to be filled in. Though she knew nothing about it, she came out of the house and stood at the side of the ditch whilst I and Pilgrim, the laborer, were discussing the best way to fill it up. The elder three stood by the side. I could see her there now holding one of the bows and arguing about the ditch being filled in until proper arrangements had been made for draining it another way. I therefore insisted on the work being commenced at once, so I did not want the filling in completed. I don't think I should have done it. Had I not wanted money very badly. I made one final appeal to Miss Holland to let me have some money, but she refused. She was so mean that she would not trust me with even the wages to pay the farm ends. And at last I was so pushed in a corner that I determined to finish the matter that week. Of course, I know all about firearms. When the wind was in a certain direction, I fired the revolver off several times in the coach house in order to see if one could hear it while they were in the back of the house. I was very glad to find that nobody heard any report. I placed the revolver fully loaded and some cartridges on a shelf in the coach house ready for me. When I wanted it. It was that seven or eight days. So I finally used it. Just a moment, Mr. Dougal. What about the testimony of the servant girl Blackwell that you made advances to her late one night? You know, what that servant girl says about me going to a door is about right. Although I think she exaggerates a little. Miss Holland and I had quite a row about it. She accused me of a lot of things. Of course, I declared that the servant's story was a lie from top to bottom, but she stuck up with the girl. She made herself so ill that she cried very nearly the old of one day. On Friday morning, we made it up. We had breakfast together on Friday morning. I got around her by lunchtime. We made up our quarrel. She'd forgive me. That was why we thought of going for a drive. It was a beautiful night. So we let the horse walk slowly home. I think it was about quarter past eight when we got back to the farm. When I'd taken the horse out, I thought she'd go in the house. But instead of that, she made some remark about it being a beautiful moonlight night. And I pushed the trap into the coach house by this time, so I stepped up to the side of the trap, reached down the revolver... And as Miss Holland stood just near the door, looking at the moon, I shot her. She dropped just like a log. And then I pulled her into the coach house. Have I lived to be a thousand years old? I shall never forget the feeling as I caught hold of both her hands and drew her along until I got her into the coach house. All kinds of things came into my mind and my heart seemed almost to stand still as I put my hand inside her dress to feel if her heart was beating. Of course, I knew that she was dead. Yet I don't know what made me do it, but I knelt down on one knee and pulled her head and asked her to speak if she could. Cecile! Cecile! Speak to me, Cecile. Do you see me? I didn't think this was much use, but why I did it, I can't tell even now. But I thought for a moment she might come to. Probably there was no blood about. I wasn't quite certain where the bullet had struck her. Great 
Beads of perspiration began to run down my back for I had a most peculiar sensation. As if someone was following me. I thought the doors of the coach house had opened. And she was walking out after me. I could almost feel her touch me. And it's true as there's a God in heaven. I was ready to drop. I must have stood there some seconds. Then I put my hand into my pocket and drew out the revolver and turned round and looked straight at the coach house. I could not quite get out of my mind. I'll get rid of the feeling that someone or something besides myself stood between me and the coach house. I still had an impression that someone had come towards me. <laughs> so I leveled up the revolver and stood there with it in my hand. I don't think I could have uttered a word to have saved my life. My tongue was like a great ball of fire and quite hurt myself. I did trying to get some saliva to moisten my mouth my parched tongue. Then I remembered how silly it was. Of course, there was no one... I right. put the revolver back into my pocket and walked back into the house. And then I don't know why, but I thought it might be all a mistake. Perhaps after all, bullet hadn't struck her. She'd only find it. She might come too if I gave her some brandy. So I caught hold of the decanter and walked across with it my hand to the coach house. But... I couldn't make up my mind for a second or two to go inside. I called out, Cecily! 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 And then I thought what a fool I was. I went into the coach up, but it was dark. All dark. I pushed the door further open so some of the light from the moon had come in. And she was in exactly the same position as I'd left her, so I knelt down and I poured some of the brandy over her face, thinking maybe it might revive her. But really, I knew this was impossible because she was dead. I knew she was dead. I tried to sit her up, but she fell back. And I knew it was all over then. Of course, I'd arranged everything. I'd mapped out everything days before I was going to bury her. I knew just where I sat down. I began thinking over new schemes. Every few minutes, I kept touching her. And feeling her pulse. And speaking to her. And now I made up my mind that it'd be best not to put her in the ditch, but to take her away and bury her somewhere else. So I took off her hat and her veil and her jacket she was wearing. I picked her up in my arms and walked down by the side of the little moat. Her head was leaning over my shoulder. And I carried her along. I wish there was a great big furnace there that I could put her in and watch her burn. I thought of cutting her up into pieces and putting her into the moat. Then I thought of the time it would take me. I was afraid of being interrupted. Somehow I wanted to bury her out of sight, and yet I wanted to keep her by the side of me. So I went back to the field and I picked her up again and carried her over to one of the haystacks. I found then that she was getting all cold and stiff, but there was a strong breeze blowing. It was rather a cold night. It was horrible to see her lying on the ground. Before I picked her up the last time, I wish she was alive again, because... Well, then I thought, after all, she hadn't done me any harm. So I knelt down, and... I do wouldn't believe this. I kissed her once or twice. All the good times we had. All the good times that seemed to come back to me. And I remembered once or twice when I'd been sick and she'd nursed me and tried to get me well. And I thought, after all, what a bit hard to do her in. Then I began to think what had happened to me if she was found. 
I thought I'd hide her in the haystack for a few days, but finally I made up my mind that I'd get rid of her once and for all. I went to get the fork and carried some straw and laid it down at the bottom of the ditch. And I began to think of the way she'd nagged me and the difficulty I'd had getting money from her. So I caught hold of her hand and pulled the ring off her finger. She was very fond of this ring. It had been given to her by, well, I guess the only man she ever really loved. After her to tell me the story one day, she did. She said that while her aunt kept a ladies' school at Liverpool, she used to help her in the management. Why, so? I grew very fond of a brother of one of the pupils, a midshipman who'd returned home from a voyage. He had some relatives in the West Indies. He went out there shortly afterwards and took some kind of post. He used to write me letters. And just when everything looked bright, he was drowned through the upsetting of the yacht and his body was not recovered for some days. When it was found, the ring that he wore on his finger was taken off, sent home to his parents, who gave it to me. Well, I took that ring off her finger. And just as I did so, a stray moonbeam came through one of the cracks of the door and played all about her face. It made me quite shudder. Once I put my hand down and caught hold of the gold cross that was round her neck and wrenched it off, snapping the chain on which it used to hang round her neck. I turned her over, put my hand in her pocket, and took out her purse. I don't think I knew what I was doing then. I picked her up in my arms, and just as you'd carry a baby, I, I carried her out of the coach house and laid her on the straw... One minute I wanted to kiss her, and the next minute I wanted to pitch a lot of mold over her. But at last I made up my mind that I'd bury her. Bury her and get her out of sight. I thought perhaps unless I'd covered her over the fowls and scratch away the straw, so I got me some brambles and twigs and places of wood and stretched them over the body. I picked up the fork and put a thin layer of earth over the top of the brambles and straw, and then I went back into the house. Went to bed. I couldn't sleep. I got up and walked round the farm and down to the road, back again. I couldn't keep my eyes off the ditch. I'm sure I aged that night. Twenty years. I never closed my eyes the whole night long, and I could not keep still or rest for even a quarter of an hour. I tried to read. I tried to write, I tried to sleep, it was all in vain. Not one single moment's peace did I have, and I'm sure that if I went once to that ditch, I went plenty times. First thing I did when I got to the house was to open Miss Allen's desk and go through a lot of her papers in order to find out, if possible, how much money she had. She kept her accounts very neatly, but I was very disappointed when I found out she was not worth more than six or seven thousand pounds. I thought perhaps Miss Holland had some more cash concealed about the place somewhere, so I turned over her trunks and I turned over her boxes. But I could not find any, any cash. And I certainly did feel somewhat disappointed. I come out to a terrible part of my life because however clever one may be, however well one's plans have been carried out, there's always a suspicion lurking at the back of your head that you may have made one little blunder that you'll lead to the truth coming, huh? As sure as I'm alive on this earth, no one tried harder than I did to banish entirely from my mind all recollections of that terrible night. But I found it was physically impossible. It did not matter where I was or who was with me. The moment there was a lull in the conversation, the moment my attention was taken from anything, away back to the farm went my thoughts. As sure as I stand here, I can swear that I've gone into that coach house hundreds of times, expecting to see her lying on her back as I dragged her in there. But nothing would make me believe this. So I'd gone in and think for myself. I did this two or three times a day sometimes. 
And all the time I knew I buried her in the ditch and she was still there. I tried to reason with myself. Tom out of number. But it was no good. I had to go into that coach house and see for myself that she was not there. Sometimes when I've been walking along or sitting in a railway carriage, I've closed my eyes and tried to make myself believe that it was all a dream. But Miss Holland wasn't dead. It was some foolish thought that I got into my mind. I got up and and say to myself, you're not a murderer, old man. Whatever else you may be. Then I sat down again. And I felt much better. And more satisfied. But unfortunately, this didn't last very long. A few minutes later, my mind traveled back to May 19th. And I could see myself loading a revolver in the morning, putting it on a shelf, taking the pony out of the trap, standing on the step, and shooting her. Why, three years after she had been dead, I could close my eyes and still feel that I had her in my arms. Yes, sir. I could still feel her head hanging over my shoulder. I could still see her face as I laid her in the ditch. One time I could sleep Perhaps for a few hours I'd forget all about the moat farm. As time went out, I thought it impossible to get a night's rest. Then I took to walking in my sleep. And I thought I should have gone mad. When I found... I was a somnambulist. I remember one night I returned from London. After having a good look around, I went to bed. I think about 11 o'clock. I remember quite well taking off my clothes, getting into bed. Just before daybreak, I suddenly came to myself. And I found... I found I was standing by the side of the ditch. And that a, a spade... A spade... was in my hand. I was in my nightshirt. I got out of the bedroom, walked down the stairs, opened the door. Crossed over the moat bridge, gone into the coach house, and then gone to the grave with a spade in my hand. I think I must have been standing there a long time because it was very cold. My night shirt was wet with dew. I shook from head to foot. My teeth chattered. I was aching in every limb when I woke up. So I pitched the spade back into the coach house. I went back to bed. There I lay awake. Count me out. I was really afraid of myself. I thought that one of these mornings the laborers had come in and find me standing there. I thought of all kinds of methods to prevent myself from being found there. The only way that I could prevent myself walking out from the ditch in my sleep was locking the gate at the entrance of the moat bridge. I put a bit of chain around it. Before I went to bed, I used to see to it that it was padlocked. All this did not prevent my walking in my sleep, but it stopped me going out to the ditch. Because I used to go right up to the gate. As it was locked, I feel certain I used to turn around and go back to bed. I know I did this because one day, the gate was painted white. And when I woke up in the morning, I found my hands covered in white paint. Which showed that I'd gone down to the gate 
and tried to open it. I got very ill. Very ill about this time. Uh, tell me, Mr. Dougal, when did you first begin to sense danger? Before or after the investigation was started? Now, when the superintendent called at the farm, I... I think that's when I began to see danger. I thought it best to leave the farm. Leave it once and forever. <laughs> I didn't know where I was going when I left it. Sometimes I didn't seem to care. Care whether they found me. Where they didn't find me. Uh, I was so. I was so. I was so tired of it all. And yet, the moment I, I thought of a hand being placed on my shoulder, oh, I conjectured up all kinds of pictures. I've seen myself tried. I've heard myself sentenced. And I've felt myself standing on the scaffold with a rope round my neck. But at times as I sat in my cell, I often thought that after all, I was only living a life of misery. And it'd be better to end it. Mercury production of The Moat Farm Murder, a radio documentary by the Mercury's good friend, Mr. Norman Colwyn. I was Dougal the killer, and Mercedes McCambridge was heard as Miss Holland, his hapless victim. We'll be back in just a few seconds to tell you about next week, but first, Jim Amici. Let me again remind you to be patient with your dealer when occasionally these days he's unable to supply you with all the Pat's blue ribbon you'd like. He's doing his best. You can be sure of that. Yes, and here's something else you can be sure of. Every single bottle of Pabst Blue Ribbon you do get will, as always, be the happy blending of never less than 33 fine brews. Yes, every frosty glass you enjoy will, as always, have that famous Pabst Blue Ribbon flavor. Not too heavy, not too light, but fresh, clean, sparkling. With the real beer taste, coming through the way you like it. So keep asking for blended splendid Pabst Blue Ribbon. And now, Mr. Wells. Next Friday night, if you're minded to join us, we're bringing you one of the most heartwarming stories ever written in America. Ring Lardner, the author, is past argument, one of the best of all the writers our country has ever produced. And it's with pride and humility that we same time think station his deathless portrait of an old couple very much in love with each other, Golden Honeymoon. Until then, ladies and gentlemen, speaking for my sponsors, the makers of Pabst Blue Ribbon, and for all of us on the Mercury, not excepting the old maestro Bernard Herman, who, like the poor, is always with us with his wonderful music, we remain, as always, obediently yours. <laughs> this program came to you through the courtesy of the Pabst Brewing Company of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, makers of Splendor, Splendor, Pabst Blue Ribbon. This year, when food shortages threaten starvation to millions, our farmers need all the help they can get to bring in the crop. So all of you who can work for the remainder of the season should get in touch with your agent or local farm employment office immediately. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>
this is Chesterton Radio, your home for podcasts of works by G.K. Chesterton, plus drama, comedy, mystery, science fiction, big bands, and much more. The soundtrack to your Chesterton day at chestertonradio.com. The Columbia Broadcasting System presents Norman Corwin's One World Flight. <laughs> Standing in the Mykovsky station of the metro under the heart of Moscow, a waiting train signals to workmen in the subway to clear the track. You're strolling along Hallam Street in London, and you're overtaken by a Cockney street peddler selling cut iris, cut cauliflower, Yorkshire blue peas, and brand new potatoes. You're in the library of a pleasant house in New Delhi, India, talking with Pandit Nehru about the world and the future. He says, But if we think of freedom for one world, then all this racialism and uh, one race or one nation or one country being fundamentally superior to another, that has to be given up. No doubt people are not all alike. Nations are not alike. Everybody is not... uh, the same or as clever or as strong as anybody else. You're in a hotel in Manila, sleeping at 6.45 in the morning, and suddenly you're awakened by sounds of the reconstruction of the Philippines going on right outside your window. What you've just listened to, the hammering, Mr. Nehru, the peddler, and the subway train are fragments among several hundred authentic sounds of foreign places and voices of foreign people to be heard in a new series of CBS broadcasts beginning with this one. Last February, two American organizations, the Wilkie Memorial and the Common Council for American Unity, established an award consisting of a flight around the globe, a flight intended to dramatize and perpetuate Wendell Wilkie's concept of one world. The first winner of the award, chosen on the basis of contributions already made to this ideal, was the CBS playwright and producer, Norman Corwin. Last June, Mr. Corwin, with Lee Bland of CBS and a magnetic wire recorder, set out on a globe-circling trip in the course of which they preserved a hundred hours of the voices and opinions of the people of 16 countries. Tonight and every Tuesday night for the next 12 weeks, Mr. Corwin will bring you the story and record of his One World Flight. music, all identified sounds, all foreign voices heard in these broadcasts were actually recorded by Corwin and Bland in various parts of the world. These singers, for example, are Arab women sitting on a rooftop in Cairo on a warm evening last August, celebrating the independence of Egypt, an historic event which occurred that very morning. broadcasts have to do with some of the people of the world and with much of the state of the peace, and therefore I believe they have to do with you and me. For today, if war comes anywhere, it will be close to us. No place is far anymore. We are one with others, whether we want to be or not. Tonight, we will stop in no single country, but by way of preview, introduce you to some of the hope and despair that exist side by side in the world today. This aspect I present first before beginning to tell you any progressive story of the flight because to the observer traveling as I did, it is what strikes you first 
and asserts itself most often. The war has left in its wake all kinds of attitudes and conditions of mind and spirit, ranging from unshakable confidence to active fear. And it becomes apparent, at least it did to me, that in the drawing together toward the middle of extremes of economic, social, political, and even of certain religious philosophies, lies the safest, if not the only way, to a lasting peace. Within this theme, you will hear tonight moments out of interviews with people high and low, optimists, pessimists, liberals, fascists, communists, stevedores, prime ministers. For example, in the cabinet room at number 10 Downing Street, you sit with the British prime minister, Clement Attlee, at the long bare cabinet table. He puffs a pipe, and he answers your questions in a friendly, relaxed manner. After all, we're trying to clear up after the greatest war in history. And you can't expect all the problems of that war, and a good many left over from the First World War, to disappear overnight. Trouble is, of course, all the differences to make the dramatic news. But I think it's worthwhile paying some attention to the areas activity in which there's agreement. Hopeful enough. But then there's the poor widow Camilla in the Italian mountain village of Lanuvio who lost all her hopes in a single day of war. You stand in a square of a shattered village under the broiling sun. Her neighbors crowd about you. You ask her questions through an interpreter. Uh, how big is her family? I live with three spirits. Two of me are morti, così go l'incursione a lei, and so much they can do that. And there is a stone that I have to go there, così, step over the wall. She had three children. Two have died, and she has one alive now. Two of them were killed in the bombardment. Uh, now, what about her husband? Her vostro marito è morto lì. Two of them are morti with l'incursione. Uh, her husband was killed in the same bombardment. All of them died together. Two children and a husband. I see. So she has one child left. She's one child left. Mio marito, due figli, due nipoti, tre cognati, una cognata, insomma, dieci persone sono morte di famiglia. She lost her father and her husband, as well as two children and about ten relatives, close relatives in all. You ask where she lives, what she gets to eat. She says she never eats breakfast. At midday, she has a thin soup, and in the evening, a piece of bread. Can uh, she not afford to eat more, or is there not enough food in the available? Non c'ho denari per poter comprarlo. Vedi che c'ho sto figlio, ce l'ho. Che adesso ce l'ha la zia, ma ce l'ha l'altra. E perché io non posso tenerlo? It's because she has no money. And uh, they can't, the situation is so bad that she sort of farms a little boy out to various relatives who can feed him a little better every now and then. And uh, what, are, what are her hopes for an improvement in this condition? I read the esperanza che si cambiano gli affari, o che esperanza ha vita? Non io so di neppure io che speranza possa vita. It's very difficult to say. She has no idea at all what hope to look for, what she can hope to look for. And then the tall, thin finance minister of Denmark, Thorkel Christensen, who's not so sure that we're finished making widows through warfare. You interview him in an anteroom to the house chamber in the parliament building in Copenhagen. He pauses for a long moment before he answers your point-blank question about war. Do you feel that there is going to be another war? I'm very much afraid of it. In fact, you are. You think there is a real danger of it? I think there is. And across the world from Copenhagen, at a dockside in the beautiful harbor of Sydney on a clear, sharp day of the Australian spring, a big, gray-haired, God-fearing stevedore takes time off from loading the good ship Corinda to point out a path for the nations. I'm a member of the aristocracy of the working class. That's the Waterside Workers' Federation. Uh, now, we're looked upon as the aristocracy because we give leads in matters of progress that affect the workers. Now, where did you learn your very good uh, uh, extemporaneous power of speech? 
I learnt it from intense study for many years, by myself. You were not a university man, a college no. man? No. I've only had uh, an ordinary education, but by the power of God through the Holy Spirit, he has put in my heart the words that are acceptable to hearers by trying to live the life. Trying, Mark. You I don't say that I've succeeded, but I've made a reasonably successful effort. Do you uh, share with the uh, two gentlemen that I've just interviewed here confidence that we are going to get through the next uh, 25 or 50 years without war? Uh, no. No, you will not uh, get through without war unless the world regenerates itself in a sincere line. I would suggest that the great powers assure Russia that they do not want war and also get an assurance from her that she is satisfied to work out her own destiny with the territory she has and her compensation as the result of a terrific sacrifice of this war. And in Russia, the editor of the Moscow News, Mr. Borodin, addresses a dinner given you at the Hotel Metropole by the Soviet Society for Foreign Cultural Relations. He speaks very slowly, professing the friendship of his country for America, describing what he calls Russia's, quote, tremendously difficult struggle to protect the great interests of a great people, unquote. And then he warns against those who are crying for war. You may have difficulty at first making out the words conflagration and influence and the name of the writer Gorky. Please tell your people that conflagrations don't start at once. They start from a spark. From those who are part of they have no influence. But the conflagration starts, and there are people who will start the whole con conflagration, as our great Gorky said, in order that it be wrong for some people. Let me repeat that. Gorky said that there are people in the world who would start the conflagration so long as it affords them the beat of war. They don't care for the interest of humanity, so long as it keeps them warm. Those are, those are the warmongers, the war profiteers. Those are the reactionaries who created fascism, who brought up fascism, and who are still cherishing the hope of someday using fascism in order to kill you and me and every man, woman, and child who profess the great ideals of democracy. The phrase, one world, comes easy. Nothing hard to remember about it. There was a time when the world meant to the average man a blur of lands and matters outside his life. Long journeys he could never take, languages he would never understand, and customs he could never fathom. But twice in our time, the world reached into his life and shook him up. That was the least it did. It was a world problem, not a local feud which took your neighbor's boy out of his class, put him in uniform, and killed him. And it could happen again. Tonight, if you think much about it, one world means, urgently and above everything else, survival. It has higher meanings, of course, such as the wholesale rewards of total unity, meanings not comfortably smirked at or dismissed, like goodwill and the brotherhood of man. But it was within the less idealistic meaning of the phrase within the immediate and concrete meaning that I set out on this trip. I went looking for practical testaments of agreement or signs of a uniting world. I found less of these than we would wish for, but I also found plenty of hope. I listened to people's troubles and to nations' troubles, which are often the same thing. I witnessed many a disagreement, sometimes in the form of violence and death. But because I felt all of it belonged in the record, I took down as well as I could, whenever and wherever I could, what I thought related to the present and the future and to one world. At no time did I attempt to conduct a poll or to make mathematical measurements. In essence, I recorded that which I felt to be significant to us and to these days. Not always were the profoundest things said by presidents and premiers. Often, 
in quite unexpected places. Ordinary people, humble people, spoke wisdom which came through interpretation undamaged. One night, I was dining outdoors at the Gina restaurant in Rome, and I fell to talking with Sanego, a young Italian partisan who'd fought the Nazis in the mountains and killed a dozen of them with his bare hands. He was at first shy about talking because he looked upon me as a foreign correspondent. But at last, he opened up. You'll hear him for a moment and then the interpretation as it was pieced together. I didn't with much pleasure to the questions of an I would have been rather unwilling to answer the question of a foreign correspondent uh, because I know that uh, Italy has been beaten in this war and uh, that the uh, winning party is the country to whom this, Amer this foreign correspondent belongs. But I, uh, once I've heard what the creed of Mr. Corwin is, that is to say, uh, one world, I must say that that is the creed of all my fellow uh, partisans and of myself. That's what we used to say when we were lost in the mountains, in heavy snow and rain, with nobody to protect us but the stars. Everybody, every one of us said, why isn't there one world, one flag under which we can all march and be united? That is why we have been fighting, and that is why we believe and we sincerely believe that all the world should be very simply unified under one flag because we do, want, we do not want to keep on fighting for separate flags, for several separate colors, but for one flag and one color throughout the world. And the grease-stained Polish worker in the power plant on the banks of the Vistula in shattered Warsaw. I asked him what he, as a man who worked in the generation of power, thought of the possibilities of atomic energy replacing steam and coal. He answered that... No, możliwe to jest, ale w każdym razie jest to może energia atomowa, jednak nie będzie, nie uwładni światem. I think uh, that uh, maybe it's possible, but I don't think that uh, the atomic energy will be the most, uh, the biggest power in the world. What does he think will be the biggest power in the world? A to pan myśli, że będzie największą siłą na świecie. I think that uh, the human being. He thought that the human being was a greater generator than steam or uranium. In the powerhouse, the restaurant, on the farm, by the dockyards, in chambers of parliament, in the ruined village, underground in mines, and in planes flying above clouds, I found few people anywhere who did not want exactly what you want, to live in peace, to let others live in peace, to prosper, to progress, to think freely, to speak, assemble, worship, and travel freely. Very, very few whom I met considered it sentimental and visionary to talk in terms of a unified world in which security and peace can become sensations greater than tension, crisis, and war. Some had doubts as to the way of achieving one world or cynicism with respect to their chances of living to see it. But they all want it. They yearn for it. They are willing to work for it. There are exceptions, of course, I suppose. They have to be in order to prove rules. The exceptions were mainly selfish or maleducated people, or the type incapable of drawing any inference from all that has happened to them in their lives, incapable of learning the simplest lesson out of the costliest and most terrible experience in human history. There was, for example, the dock hand in the same group as the self-styled aristocrat of the workers. This fellow thought Hitler was not a bad sort at all. He felt the Fuhrer had rescued Germany from a great evil. Well, I was in Hamburg in 1923, and the, and the conditions brought about by the Jews in, in Germany, they staked into Germany when the war was on, when the last war was on, and uh, the conditions brought about by the uh, Jewish occupation in Germany were frightful. And the young Australian accountant on the busy street corner, who said he was convinced that fascism was dead and buried. The body, he said, lies molding in the grave and will for a long time. Yet he had a race theory that was mighty like a fascist's. But I consider that the potential danger to world peace lies in the coloured races. Uh, I can see in the uh, in embryo 
the world is, so I can see in the very uh, backward, primitive people of the islands and uh, the end of Asia, the parts of Asia that I visited, uh, a potential Japanese. Uh, I consider that he, given the same opportunity as the Japanese, as many people would today, they talk about raising his standard of living, educating him, and more or less raising him to our standard, which is a indus highly industrial and mechanical standard, I think that he, that he will possibly become a Frankenstein monster and turn on us and devour us as the Japanese. And the young girl in devastated Manila, who, though she well knew what war can be, still could make this recommendation to America. If I were your people in America, I am going to induce President Truman right now to finish up Russia. Because if he does that right now, we have no worry about her in the next, in the future. There were long distances and intervals between people who recommended this kind of solution for the world's problems. The last such instance before this one came 10,000 miles earlier, not directly, but within a story told me by an UNRWA worker, an American woman in Italy. She told this story of the way she had celebrated VJ Day in Bologna. I was in Bologna on VJ Day when I'd heard the first word that the war with Japan was over. I uh, went into the nearest American hotel because I was very anxious to be uh, around some fellow countrymen at this time. And I introduced myself to two young American lieutenants who were with the Air Corps. One of the boys talked with me and said that his father was a very wealthy man, and his father had always been in favor of wars because he thought it was a good way of reducing the population. But he said he felt sure that his father, after his being in the war, and after his father knew about the horrors of the atom bomb, would change even his mind. Consequently, this boy thought there was a good hope of future permanent peace. And suddenly a man came up, another officer. He walked up, joined us, commenced talking about the atom bomb, and said that in his mind, America had already lost the war and had done a very serious thing when it had not used the atom bomb uh, on Russia. One of the young lieutenants arose, walked quietly over to where the other um, officer was standing who had made this remark, hit him with all his strength and said, you have desecrated this day for me. Among people who had experienced war, the sentiments of this officer whose jaw was hit and of the Filipino girl whose city had been hit were rare. Much more representative were the Czech underground fighter, Dr. Sebi, and the businessman, Edgel, in Bathurst, and the son of the founding president of China, Dr. Sun Fo, in Nanking. The first of these, Dr. Sibi, was an underground fighter, a lawyer who had been captured by the Nazis, tortured with exceptional cruelty, and sentenced to die. I bring you now the voice of Dr. Sibi in his full statement, except that the recording is poor, as you can hear from this sentence. Uh, this is what, I, what, uh, what would be my uh, message, my humble message, message to the United Nations. Dr. Sibi said, quote, this is what would be my humble message to the United Nations. Not to breed the idea that there is a necessity of a war between the Western and Eastern conceptions of life. I know that this is the last hope of fascism. In every part of the world, and especially in Germany, fascists and reactionaries do everything in their power to breed the conception of the inevitability of war. I hate this conception, and I am deeply convinced that it is not true." Unquote. My talk with Dr. Sebi was in the lobby of a hotel in Prague. 17,000 miles further along in the trip, in the city of Bathurst, on the edge of the Blue Mountains in New South Wales, the owner of a prosperous canning factory, Mr. Edgel, was in essential agreement with Dr. Sebi. I had a long interview with this industrialist in his noisy plant one morning, and at the end of it he said, The, the bogey of communism, and I think a great deal less than it was some years ago, and anyway, we're beginning to realize that communists are ordinary people, much like ourselves, and their views cannot in the long run be so very greatly different to our own. And uh, why shouldn't one be optimistic? What's the good of being pessimistic? I think it's, uh, it's only by optimism that we can create a better world, we can get better living conditions, 
perhaps shorter hours of work and perhaps more money to spend and more leisure for sport. Maybe that's the best thing, we, the thing we all want, but whatever it is, we've got to work together and be optimistic of the final result. Another man who thought it important to get together and in a country which badly needs it was Dr. Sun Fo, son of the late great Dr. Sun Yat-sen, founder of the Chinese Republic. Dr. Sun, now president of China's legislative yuan, spoke at a diplomatic reception to us in Nanking. Dr. Sun said he'd been asked by Chinese newspapermen outside to comment on whether he thought that the opposing Guomindang and communist parties were sincere about wanting peace. He told the meeting... I believe, naturally, that the Chinese government and the Guomindang are really sincere about peace within China. I also believe that the Chinese Communist Party is also sincere about peace. For uh, there is no man in his senses who would want war and bloodshed. A lawyer who had fought in the underground, a government leader, and a businessman, 17,000 miles apart, but eye to eye on the necessity of getting together. And all along those 17,000 miles and the 20,000 more which lay across our route, the majority of people everywhere had, to greater or lesser degree, hope, optimism, confidence. This in spite of the fact that many had lost their loved ones and had seen their countrymen die, had been invaded and pillaged, had suffered cold, starvation, torture. They were hopeful in spite of the known terrors of the last war. Hopeful they would not be made to know the thousandfold terrors of any next war. There were places in the world where hope was feeble or had been extinguished. And there the concept of one world had the toughest going. Among the helpless, the homeless, the underfed, the underpaid, the undereducated, the underprivileged. And it seemed to me that not the least job to be done is to distribute hope or the reason to hope among those elements of great populations who today are hopeless and helpless. If the confidence of a lawyer in Prague and the businessman in Bathurst could be shared with the Salahin of Egypt and the untouchable of India and with the widow of Lanuvio, then perhaps we'd be getting on toward the world of Wendell Wilkie's dream. But in the meantime, as I went around, the widow became to me a symbol of hopelessness. This woman with no food, no home, no prospects, her husband and two children buried in the ruins of fascism. I heard her voice in many places far from Italy. This voice and the echo of guns only lately stilled and the silence of the cemeteries the begging of arms and the whimper of hungry children. This voice and the mute rubble of wasted towns and cities. These were the sounds of need. Need for the hope and for the reality of a united world. invite you to be with us next week when we will board a constellation and begin the story of the flight as it started in New York. You have been listening to Norman Corwin, CBS playwright, producer, and first winner of the One World Award in the first of a series of Columbia broadcasts entitled One World Flight, the authentic story with recordings of his 37,000-mile global trip. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
Norman Corwin brings you his Odyssey of Runyon Jones. Being a fantasy in six scenes and one act with no moral attached. The fifth program, incidentally, of this series. Starring Michael Artis as Runyon. And illuminated by an original musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Semler. Lost dogs? Yeah. I'm looking for my dog. Your name? Runyon Jones. Runyon? Yes, sir. It's a terrible name, but Mother says I'll like it when I grow up because it's distinguished, she says. The other boys all call me Onion. What's the name of your dog? Putsy. Putsy? Yes, sir. He's very smart, sir. When did you lose him? Yesterday morning. Where? Right outside my house. He was chasing an automobile. Why? He wanted to bite the tires, I think. Front or rear? All of them. What happened? The car ran over him. And then? He was killed, sir. Then you're on the wrong floor. This is the Department of Lost Dogs. What you want is the Department of Deceased Dogs. Well, where is that, sir? Two flights up. Here, take this slip and hand it to the man at the desk. Thank you, sir. Department of Diseased Dogs? Deceased, not diseased. Let me see that slip. Yes, sir. Hmm. Putsy. You run in, Jones? Yes, sir. Just a minute, let me look at the file. Jones, J. Orlando, Penelope, Pluto, Putsy Jones. Mm-hmm. One and a half years old, veteran auto chaser, leash, attitude. Hmm. Young man, uh, I don't think there's anything we can do for you. You can't find Putsy? Ordinarily, in a good many cases, when a boy's dog dies from old age or natural causes, or is merely run over while chasing a cat in line of duty, or is fatally wounded in a fight with other dogs, we can make arrangements with St. Bernard, the proprietor of Dog Heaven, for the return of the animal on a limited basis. What's a limited basis? But in the case of Putsy, he's down in the files as an inveterate auto chaser and tire nipper class four. Also, it is known that he's resisted leashes, that he bit a dog catcher on August 11th last, and that he stayed out all night on three separate occasions. I'm sorry to say he's not in dog heaven. No? Gosh. Are you sure, mister? Couldn't he have snuck in when nobody was looking? He is not in dog heaven, and that settles that. Well, where is he, then? In the place where all ill-behaved curs are punished. Purgatory. Where's that? I'll go there. Oh, no. Impossible. But he won't chase any more automobiles. I swear it. Look, honest, I'll spit on my hand and touch my forehead three times. What's that mean? That's the secret oath the Elmwood Street AC, which means pledge of honor. Nevertheless, it will be impossible. But, Pootsie, you'll be lonely without me. I have to find him. Please go now. I'm busy. But, gee whiz, I came all the way now here. Now, go quietly, Mr. Jones, or I shall have to call an officer. I won't go. I won't go without Pootsie. You've got him somewhere and you're hiding him. Now, me. listen here. I won't listen. You give me my dog back or I'll kick you in the shins. Pootsie! No, no, no. Pootsie! No, no. You locked him up and you won't let me have him because you want to keep him for yourself. I know. No, no. He, he, no, 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 no. Stop. Stop there, kicking me. No, stop that. Officer. 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 Stop that. What's going on here? This young ruffian is a perverse character. Because his name is Jones. Quiet. Quiet. I think you'd both better explain the matter to the superintendent of the division. I certainly will. I'm not going to stand for being kicked in the shins by any young brat who happens to come along. No wonder his dog's in purgatory. I can see where the animal learned his bad manners. You take that back. I did not teach Putsy his bad manners. He taught himself. Now, quiet, both of you, and follow me. We'll explain it all to the super. I will tell the super what you said. (laughs) 
I see. Well, there are things to be said for both sides. Now, first of all, I suggest that you two shake hands and apologize to each other. Well, all right. I'm sorry I kicked you in the shins, mister. That's all right. I uh, may possibly have lost my temper a bit, too. Yes. And now, Mr. Jones, let me explain what the clerk was trying to tell you. Uh, We do not keep any dogs here on the premises. The most we can do is to refer applications to the right parties. It so happens we have connections with Dog Heaven through our good friend St. Bernard. But unfortunately, there's no contact whatsoever, uh, none at all, with Kurgatory. Well, isn't there any way of getting to Kurgatory, sir? Because I'll go myself if you'll only tell me how to get there, sir. I got here by myself. Clerk, there's obviously quite an attachment to the dog in this case. He was yeah. attached to a leash, but he kept breaking away. On account, he liked to run fast. Yes, um... Now, Mr. Jones, I think you're a likely lad. So I'm going to tell you frankly that the chances of your ever getting Putsy back are very, very slim. They are? Why is that, sir? Uh, Because Kurgatory is a great, great distance away and extremely hard to get to. In fact, nobody we know seems to know just how one does get there. But if you're willing to take risks and chances... Yes, sir, I'll do anything. Gee whizzikers, if you only knew Putsy. Then I'll tell you how to get somebody who may know somebody who knows somebody else who can send you to the right place so that you might be able to find out how to set out for Kurgatory. Gosh, would you, sir? Glad to. Clerk, get me Form 5, the blue slip, and also applications for the interdivisional visa and interdepartmental passport. Then clip on the transfer coupons and the pink manifest. Uh, Yes, sir. Now, Mr. Jones, this is what you do. There's only one person I know who can possibly set you on the right track, and that's the head of the Division of Time. We call him Father Time. His place is quite far, and you'll have to make several changes before you get there. That's what all the tickets are for. Shall I say you sent me? Oh, uh, that won't do much good. He's very busy, and he won't have much time to talk to you. Uh, Tell him quickly what you're after, and if he can assist you, he'll tell you quickly. He hates to waste time. The uh, papers, please. Uh, Very good. Mr. Jones, will you fill out this blank and sign these two while I stamp these documents? Yes, sir. Um, Clerk, uh, see that he gets put safely on the golden escalator with instructions to change at the Interheaven Junction for the Nebula Express. Uh, um, uh, wouldn't it be better for him to take the uh, westbound tower special? That crosses the meridian uh, uh, two light hours ahead of the NED. Yes, but then he'd have to wait at Asterion for the ecliptic local. It's better the other way. Maybe right. Have you finished, Mr. Jones? Yes, sir. I got an ink spot all over the sheet here. Uh, Will that make any difference? No, no. Well, Mr. Jones, I guess that does it. Thank you, Mr. Superintendent. Gosh, Putsy's sure going to be glad to see me. Uh, Don't be too sure you'll find him, because you're liable to be disappointed, you know. But good luck, anyway. Thank you. Now, young man, <laughs> if you come with me, I'll see that you get onto the golden escalator. All right, I'm coming. you came all the way here to ask if I know anybody who can help you find a dog named Putsy? Yes, Father Time. Uh, Don't you realize that I'm very busy? Yes, Father Time, but it won't take you long to tell me whether... Quiet, quiet. I've got to listen for the time signals. Ah, that means that the eclipse of three moons on Jupiter was right on time. He was a little dog about so... When you hear the time signal, it will be exactly half past 1.62 on Uranus. Ah, shucks. That was 37 thousandths of a second late. I must make a note of that. We'll have to make it up in the year 7,302. 
Uh, now, what was it you wanted, little man? Well, sir, uh, could you tell me how I could get to Purgatory? Because my dog, Putsy... Oh, yes, yes. Uh, was he a delinquent dog? No, sir, a mongrel. When you hear the musical rose, it will be the 172nd millionth anniversary of the birth of the first dinosaur. You're from Earth, aren't you? Yes, sir. Well, then I want you to know that I am heartily ashamed of the kind of time that they have down there in Greenwich. Yes, sir. And I want you to understand why. Yes, sir. Because it's so mean. It's pretty mean time. Yes, sir. And now about you and your dog. I don't know where Kurgatory is at all. It used to be on Sirius, the dog star. But the neighbors complained so about the piteous howling and whining which came from there. Well, they had to move. Why, because all the dogs in Kurgatory are tortured, of course. Does it hurt him bad? <laughs> well, naturally. What a question. Why, I've heard there are fleas in Kurgatory as big as a lion. That's only one of the attractions. Uh, well, uh, is there some way I could find out how to get there? Well, um, the only one that I know who could possibly help you is M.N. M.N.? Listen, don't you know anything, lad? Mother Nature. Well, well, there goes the vernal equinox on Aldebaran. Now, Mr. Putsy. No, that's my dog. A quiet Putsy. Now, here's how you get to M.N.'s place. When First... When you hear the note of the space Bhutan, that will be time for all visitors who are not invited to get ready to leave. little boy, but let me think. I'll tell you who might. Just off the main skyway between Castor and Pollock, before you get to the red light of McBuddha, there's a harpy who... Excuse me, Mrs. Nature, but these papers have to be signed right away if you want to get them on the Solar Limited. Wait a minute. What's that you have in your hand? A uh, vacuum bottle, ma'am. Some warm nectar in case I get hungry on the way. Don't you know I abhor a vacuum? Give me that. Oh. Now, Blossom, don't let me lose my patience with you again. If you get hungry, there's plenty to drink in the Milky Way. Yes, Mother Nature. Now, Runyon, as I was saying, this harpy is a very strange spirit, full of lots of esoteric knowledge. Uh, does and... he know where I can find Putsy? Well, that I can't tell you. But there's no harm asking. Incidentally, it's a she, not a he. In fact, she's more commonly known as an it. Does it fight? Oh, no. But you may have difficulty understanding it because of the way this harpy talks. You will have to hold this little charm. Oh, now, where did I put it? Oh, yes, here it is. You will have to hold this in your left hand while the harpy talks in order to make out anything at all. Gee, isn't it pretty? It's like an Aggie in marble. Yes, it's the most charming charm I have. Don't lose it now. Because it has the power of translating the harpy's language into your own. No, ma'am. I won't lose it. I'll take care of it like as if it was Putsy. Yes, sir. I mean, yes, ma'am. I mean, yes, it. <laughs> No, P-O-O-T-Z-Y. Chasing an automobile. Well, uh, yes, um, uh, well, you see how it is, sir. I mean... No, 
Nobody seems to know where Purgatory is. I hope he does. Uh, how do I get there, Miss Harpy? I mean, Mr. I... Uh, I mean, the Harpy. Purgatorium. Does it bite? Don't be alarmed, Mr. Jones. You see, the nearby wolves, who occupy what is known as Lupin Limbo, resent certain of the policies and practice here in Purgatory, to say nothing of the smell. They do? 
Ah, that means the board of directors has reached a decision on your application. We can go in now. Mr. Jones, will you sit here? Thank you. Gentlemen of the board, this is Mr. Runyon Jones, the veritable whose request to be reunited with his dog put the number 17 billion, 6 million, and 12. We've just discussed. Mm. Mr. Jones, how do you do, Jones? Mr. Jones? Jones. 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 Jones, we have gone into this matter most carefully. That's good. We fully appreciate the, uh, the, the pains to which you've gone and the trouble... Oh, it uh, was nothing. ...you've taken. We're also aware of the unusual devotion you have shown the said putsy. And all these factors have entered into our decision. Yes, sir. Then can I see Putsy and have him back? The unanimous decision of the board of directors is that you may not. What? You mean I can't... Sorry, but it is entirely contrary to the established rules and regulations of the institution. If we made an exception for you, it might lead to all kinds of complications. But, but can I see Putsy for just a minute? Sorry, Joan. Not even for a teeny-weeny second, just to peek at him through the bars and whistle at him like this. We are all very sorry, Jones, but nothing can be done for you. Incidentally, it may be of some consolation to you to know that there are no bars in Kirkadoy. That's good. The, the torture puts him back. He's got a lame foot, you know. Always had a... I hope you don't hurt him awful. What, what, what do you mean by that? Can't pop again, just a moment, Jones. I, I am proud to say that we do not torture any dogs in purgatory. Where did you get that terrible idea? Father Time told me. Oh, 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 Father Time. Why well, don't take any stock in anything he says, Jones. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, we shouldn't like this to get back to Father Time, but between you and us, uh, strictly entre nous, uh, that job of his seems to have got the better of him. He's more or less known as a crackpot. That torture talk is nonsense. Oh, oh yes, indeed, sir. Well, we've got a big docket to clear. Hadn't we better show Jones how to get back to the sidereal ferry? Uh, yes, sir, uh, Jones. I'm afraid that closes the case. Sorry. This way out, Jones. Can, can I say just one more thing, gentlemen? Well, you'll have to make it fast. Putsy's a good dog. He didn't mean to bite no tires. He just wanted to race the cars to show me how fast he could run. And he could have run faster if he wasn't lame in the leg. And the time he bet the dog catcher, that big bum... Oh, that's no kind of language. Well, he was a big bum. He heard Pussy, and Pussy wasn't doing no harm to nobody. He was just chasing a cat about this staying out all night. That was because he saw me talking to Eddie Mason's bulldog, and he got jealous. You can't blame a dog for that, can you? Honest, Pussy's the best dog in the world. Or else... What did I come all this way for him? What about the day the auto ran over him and killed him? Didn't he break away from your leash? No, sir. The leash broke. Are you sure of that, Jones? Jones? No, sir. Then the said footsie did break away. Yes, sir. Uh-oh. There you are again. Please understand that we are sorry, but there's nothing we can do. Next item, gentlemen. This way out, Mr. Jones. <laughs> Goodbye, and tell Putsy I, I... Yes, I'll tell him. Goodbye. Goodbye, Putsy. Can you hear me? No, he cannot. I will tell him goodbye for you. Thank you, sir. Uh, wait a minute. Jones, where did you get that mark over your right eye? Oh, this... Oh, that was nothing. I, I got that in the accident. What accident? Well, when I tried to prevent Putsy from being run over. And? Nothing. Well, didn't you reach Putsy in time? No, sir. Almost. But you see, the car ran over me first. Oh, the car ran over Yes, sir. That's how I got killed. Oh, Well, that's... Well, now... We might consider the seventh point. Just a moment, Jones. Yes, of course. Jones, the status of the case has changed by the fact that you gave your life to save your dog. That comes under the priorities ruling affecting the seventh clause of the Constitution of Purgatory. I see. Well, goodbye, Jim. No, 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 no. You, you don't understand. You can have the said Putsy back. I can see Putsy? Yes, sir. We'll release the said Putsy from Purgatory in your custody. Y you mean now? Yes. The officer will take you. Come, Mr. Jones. Uh, yes, right away. Thanks. Gee... He's 
Down at the end of the long corridor. Well, here we are. He's right inside that door. Right inside there? Yeah. Just open the door and walk right in. Uh, wait a minute. What is it, Jones? Do I look all right? Oh, yes, Mr. Jones. You have been listening to The Odyssey of Runyon Jones, written, directed, and produced by Norman Corwin for CBS and starring Michael Artist in the role of Runyon Jones. Cassette copies of this series are available at 1-800-411-MIND. That's 1-800-411-MIND. Funding for 13 by Corwin was made possible by generous grants from the Amundsen Foundation and the North Star Fund. Support for the national distribution of the series comes from National Public Radio member stations and NPR. This is NPR, National Public... WRVO FM 89.9, Oswego, Syracuse, and online at wrvo.fm. to dial this program in time to attend a trial stranger than any since we first learned the knack of breathing. And that was a long time back. The poor folks listening to other stations will lose all this. But congratulations to you for being no such fool as to miss the undecided molecule. Columbia presents Corwin. Tonight, in the third of a limited series of eight broadcasts for CBS, Norman Corwin brings you The Undecided Molecule, a rammed fantasy concerning dangerous developments among the elements, as disclosed by Robert Benchley, Norman Lloyd, Groucho Marx, Vincent Price, Sylvia Sidney, Keenan Wynn, and the music of Carmen Dragon, conducted by Lud Gluskin. The Undecided Molecule. <laughs> cosmic alarm, which means I fear some woeful harm is afoot or a wing in the universe. Some deplorable thing, some active curse, like a falling sky, or a new star cluster been banged up by a cluster buster. Sounds to me like a dried up sea, or another ice age for a spell. Nor maybe it's only a freezing hell. On the other hand, it might possibly be that Hitler is alive and well. But after all, there's no point guessing... If it rings again in a manner pressing, I'll answer the interstellar phone. I wish they'd leave a feller alone. Why only last year? Hello, hello. Yes, this is he. What? Who? What's that? Say that again. But where? But how? But why? But when? Individually and solely? Now, wait a minute. Take it slowly. It did. Oh, no. Oh, no. Not that. Holy jumping Jehoshaphat. I'll call a session right away. You bet. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Okay. Oh, grunt. Oh, moon. Oh, damn it. We are faced with a calamity. I must be cool as liquid air. Hold on. Who's that? Who's pulling my hair? Why, it is I. What am I scary at? Nonsense. I'll phone the secretary at. Oh, dear, I am in such a tizzy. The obvious rhyme the line is busy. I'll try again. There's no harm trying. Oh, I'm dying, Egypt. 
dying. Hello. Say, this is the fifth VP in charge of physiochemistry. Now, listen here. An especially perky molecule has gone berserk. It has refused to be confined, incorporated, or assigned to anything. It simply sits with a calm expression, and it knits. Now, by all means, we must prevent such an utterly dangerous precedent. One holdout molecule, unpent, can cause the cosmos great ferment. We must arraign this beast and try it. The charge? Inciting particles to riot. Okay, arrange. I mean arraign. I mean all three. I mean the twain. No, never mind. Just get it booked. Or else the universe is cooked. Oh, me, oh, my. Goodbye, goodbye. <coughs> and adjudications of physiochemical relations, Department of the Interior of the Atom, Criminal Sitting, Division of Investigation, Charge, Countercharge, Accusation and Confession, is now in session. The court will rise and face the justice who will adjust this case. See that your concentration centers on his honor, the justice, just as he enters. Which he is doing even now. Everybody bow. Everybody bow. Uh, uh, <coughs> <coughs> to it. Contrary notwithstanding, uh, you may sit. Clank, read the charge. May it please the court, it all to wit. It pleases the court. Get on with it. Whose voice is home? The cosmos and all the spheres, systems, clusters, galaxies, orbits, planets, satellites, mm. together with all species of animals, vegetables, and minerals appertaining thereto, mm. of all conditions of age, social standing, and sex, mm. versus the anonymous molecule hereinafter referred to as X. Mm. What's the charge against uh, said molecule? Unwilling to be named, rebelling when defined, declining to be blamed, objecting when assigned, protesting when selected, resisting an attack, refusing to be directed, and talking back. Most oh, serious, most dangerous, so strange, it's almost strangerous, insidious, precarious, a shade below nefarious. The possibilities in sight are frightful, meaning full of fright, and rueful, meaning full of rue, and gruesome, meaning... Uh, Rather gru. Providing, Your Honor, the charges are true. Oh, why, yes, they, they must be proven true. Which is something we have yet to do. Quite right, but uh, who was asking you? Now, is the uh, prosecutor here? Present. Well, then, a pair, a pair. The trial's on. Try not to miss it. Step up and state your case and be explicit. May it please the court, this case involves a very small matter. By this, I don't mean mere trivia or idle chatter, but a particle of matter best described as little. Smaller than a jot? Even smaller than a tittle. Are you referring to molecule X? Yes. And why don't you say so? I will, if I may so. The point, Your Honor, is that should X be acquitted here, catastrophe will follow, since it must then be admitted here that all control of elements has given away to anarchy, and every substance will perforce be jittery and panicky. Thus, when we wish a molecule to join up with some other, to make a cup or a lemon drop for the Karamazov brothers, to be a fog or a catalogue, or a lawn to be idyllic on, a beagle or a bagel, or a mountain made of silicon, they may refrain, they may desist, and if enough of them should do so, there'll never be another tenor singer like Caruso. No dog to bark, no lark to hark, no grand old man like Talleyrand. No bee will be, you'll see no sea, no ostrich fan for Sally Rand. It's staggering. It's awesome. The damage X could wreak. By simply playing possum, it, it makes me rather weak. Play order me a pony uh, uh, of... Uh... Spirits of ammonia. Now, there you are. If X's rebellion is indulged, I think it only safe to say, and fair to be divulged, there'll never be another atom of the element ammonium. So take that home and play it on your honor's own euphonium. Young man, I blasted you a disapproving snort and warn you, one more phrase like that. <coughs> Contempt of court. Now, uh, who is here for the defense? I am, Your Honor. Well, commence. I will. I do so. Now you see, sir. I see nothing of the sort. Who's paying you your fee, sir? No one at all. The way it is with me, sir, 
I'm acting out of interest in civil liberty, sir. What's liberty to do with it, if you will be so kind? Just this. Where in the universal law books can you find it's criminal for anything to be of open mind? The precedent is ample. It is. Let's have a sample. Blackstone on the elements. Case of bismuth versus molybdenum. All drat the books. Our legal forebears doubtlessly all fibbed in them. Hold on there, you, uh, you upstart. Is not the horse before the cart? Where would we be without tradition? In some advanced, improved position. What? What? Young man, are you a red? Have you been to the crimson bread? Neither to crimson nor to purple. Well, no whipper-snapping twiple. Challenge me. What do you take me for? A most distinguished expert on the law. Hmm. Very sensible thing you've said today. Uh, where were we in this trial, by the way? On the right of X to have an open mind. Now, surely justice is not yet so blind as to be unfavorably disposed. God's openness of mind, my mind is closed. Your Honor, this is scandal. This... Now, now, see here, I can handle this. Let's not have no more of your bold to do. A molecule must do what it is told to do. Now, that's decided. Suppose we break for lunch. I'm famished. Been a tiring day. I sure would like to crunch. A nice, fresh salad bowl of crispy, tangy hashish. Your Honor, I cannot refrain from calling you a fascist. Contempt of court. Blake, find the counsel for defendant, please. He has the brass to charge the bench with having fascist tendencies. Ridiculous and ludicrous. Make it a heavy fine. How could I be a fascist? Why, I am so benign, I hardly ever beat my wife. My children bow before me. I'm much admired by rattlesnakes, and birds of prey adore me. I'm tender and I'm sensitive. An anti-insurrectionist. I wouldn't hurt a cobra. And I'm anti-vivisectionist. I'm sure that's absolutely true, and that you're not the sort who would deny a prisoner his right to speak in court. Your might is mixed with mercy, and wisdom's interfused. So how about a word or two from X, who is accused? Oh, very well. Since your appeal is to the better side of me, let no one say my conduct here is prejudiced or snide of me. We'll hear from X, but make it short. Where is the little dope? Right here beneath this new electronic super microscope. Swear him in. Put your right hand on the atomic table and say as loud as you are able, I do solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and buzz was the muscle walla, buzz walla, hot set, flug of yuga, putt, putt, scuttle, button, nothing but the truth. So help me I. Now testify. What's that squeaking? My client, speaking. Well, how do you expect me to understand? There's an interpreter at hand. Where? I don't see any. Right at your elbow. Oh, yes. How do you do? I'm very well, Bo. Bo, aren't you getting a bit familiar? I suppose I am, but please think nil of it. Can you understand what the molecule says? Yes. That's my business, isn't it? A fake character. <laughs> like a film by Disney. Disney's not involved in this. Why isn't he? I don't know. Where does all this lead? Nowhere. Then please proceed to interpret X for the court of Lex. Lex is Latin for law, I guess, which shows I, too, enjoy access to more than one tongue. I'm a giant intellect. Now, let's hear your client. Proceed, if you will, Mr. Molecule. Let your story fairly leap from you. Oh, come on. Come on. We're waiting now. The court wants to hear a peep from you. Uh, X says as follows. I cannot bring myself to be just anything that's asked of me. I cannot chide my inner soul. I must confide I've set a goal. I've thought it through and cannot bear to be shampoo for oily hair. My spirit sings, my fiber spiels of nobler things and high ideals. I'll fairly bust my heart within if I am just an onion skin. I worry some. What's drearier than to become bacteria? And when I've tried hard to obey, my conscience cried, but hold, but stay. A worm for bait? I have my pride. I vacillate. I can't decide. Though Hamlet had a hard time, why, he wasn't so sad as little I. You see my lot? Yes. It's not for me to be or not, but what to be. Mm -hmm. My plight inside is bona fide. I can't decide. I can't decide. I, I, I've never been so touched or moved. I, I sniffle and I blubber. I thought my heart was made of steel, but it is made of rubber. Poor little thing, tormented so by dreams of the eugenic. Oh, fiddlesticks, this molecule is but a schizophrenic. 
How is it that in all the time since matter first appeared, each separate iota has loyally adhered to universal law without a solitary beef? Beef? Until this pipsqueak came along. Now suddenly there's grief. The heavens shake and earthquakes quake and oceans heave and slither. And dogs and cats and acrobats are in a frightful dither. A timid snip has lost its grip and whines of its neurosis. If you condone this freak, you'll reek of moral halitosis. I strongly urge your honor, purge X to its smallest decimal, or else the infinite will bow before the infinitesimal. You're right. What was I thinking of to pity Jan Schlemiel? I thought my heart was fairly soft, but it is made of steel. I shall not spoil this molecule by sparing it the rod. And so I sentence it to die before a firing squad. Perhaps a little torture face, like singeing at the stake, and drops of water on the head. And for variety's sake... A little twist of the garrot, a slice of guillotine, and X shall mark the spot where X was boiled in Vaseline. <laughs> I ask this sentence be appealed. Impossible. Your client's fate is sealed. Ah, oh, no. The court's decision is far from ineluctable. I must remind you, my good sir, that matter is indestructible. That zooks, it is. I had forgot. We can't destroy a particle. It seems we're in the power. Of this clever young upstartical. The case is lost. I must withdraw. If punishment's not capital and X cannot be executed, I don't give a rap at all. We can't imprison it, and we'd be in a most infernal stew with cosmic checks and balances eternally askew. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Vesmir, Vesmir. What will become of all of us? This little Jake and his strange quirk will surely be the fall of us. Your Honor! You, you mean me? May I have a conference with you at the bench? Why, of course. May I suggest a means by which disaster be evaded? My client is no pig head and may likely be persuaded to join some element or other. Mm. X is not a softy. No. It merely wishes to belong to something fairly lofty. Its point of view is forward. Its attitude is global. Its heart is set on being part of something good and noble. How righteous. So I suggest you demonstrate, and this will never hurt you, that being this or that or t'other has a point of virtue. Well, um, how do you propose we do it? I have a plan. I was coming to it. Invite a representative of each important kingdom. Uh, you mean like, uh, like Dempsey for the ring or Artie Shaw for Swingdom? No, but you're warm. A lion for the jungle or an eagle for all wingdom? Keep on. Remember, three of them and one for every kingdom. Oh, I know. Animal and mineral and, uh... I forget the third. The Vegetable Kingdom. Why, yes, of course. Absurd. That's splendid. We could get them here and each could make a pitch. And X could then make up its mind to which it wished to hitch. I'll call a recess in this trial while we round up a trio. Meanwhile, some music. Plank? Yes, sir. Uh, Can you sing solo, Mio? No, but the court musicians would be very glad to play for you. Where's the conductor? I'm right here. Is everything okay for you? You bet. Shall I begin, Your Honor, with a prelude by Stravinsky or a toccata for the G-string by the famous brothers Minsky? Have you anything around that Dmitry Shostakovich wrote? Oh, yes. A Pasakalia, and I'm sure that you will love it, not. I've changed my mind. I'll have a slug of music by Lynn Murray. The one he calls Wegler der Nacht, one chicken, mitten curry. Is the title correct? Yeah, I fear it is. Okay, then, play it. Here it is. One, two... Hear ye, hear ye. The spokesman for the vegetable kingdom will rise and address the court concerning the advantages to Molecule X of joining this classification. With handy allusions to paleontology, plant psychology, stems and flowers, roots and fruits, and outstanding examples of horticulture and botany, if he's got me. I doubt that X shall ever see an atom lovely as a tree. Why, nothing has got quite the charm of the most ordinary palm. With coffee beans and turpentine, and grapes which make imported wine. And as for molds and types of fungus, <laughs> we have some noted ones among us. Penicillin is a spore, noble beyond metaphor. Life is earnest, life is sweet. 
for the common sugar beet. Cotton, spinach, hemp and hop. <laughs> One could really never stop singing vegetary praise for years and months and weeks and days. Well, uh, X says that trees are chopped for wood and that he sees no special good in being a beet which people eat. X says a palm, though fine in Maine, can come to harm in a hurricane. The grapes are curse, since drink is evil, and cotton is worse for the ball weevil. X does not wish to look for trouble. It's not his dish, the vegetable. For a molecule that's supposed to be meek, the choosy Mr. X has a lot of cheek. Step down, vegetable. Let mineral speak. The spokesman for the mineral kingdom will address the court concerning the advantages to Molecule X of joining this classification, with allusions to metallurgy, gypsum, filiform silver, motor cars, nickel bars, pickle jars, and manganese. Please. Now, the way that X can best ensure his choice of substance will endure is to stop his flapping about and settle down to being a respectable metal. Oh, fiddly dee, fiddly dum, yum yum, oh boy, aluminum. If he likes the work of Byron, he can be the iron in irony. That sounds to me like pure, unalloyed non sequitur. If he wishes to be a waker, he can save in a column of mercury. And if he'd rather be gay and giddysome, there's radium, iranium, iridium. All tantalum, tungsten, talcum, tin, ipsy, pipsy, bitters, and gin, alto, sex, and copper, tax, racks, and racks, barracks, barracks, merrily, barely, chilly by chin, triple eye, zinc, and tail. Team, team, team. Oh, I beg that. Are these football yells necessary? Yes, sir. Very. Well, what do they mean? Well, amphibolsmine and pyroxene, being amygdaloidally idiochromatic, may create a stalactitic static, affecting the scalahedral speed. Mm-hmm. On this, the experts are fully agreed. Mm. Well, uh, that clears it up very well indeed. Proceed. If X wants glamour, need he be told of silver, platinum, and gold? And the safest job on any planet is to be a nice, strong rock of granite. If he likes good cooking, a dinner will boil very nicely over mineral oil. Does he try to be a wagon hitched to a star, then apply to be a Hollywood motor car? Oh, I could pour mineral law before you forever and a day, if it wouldn't bore you. Well, uh, X says, says he, that any jury will find mercury somewhat mercurial. Iron gets rusty, bare rocks too nude, talc is too dusty, oil is crude. The automobile is not his bent. One elliptical wheel means an accident. Gold you can keep. He simply box at lying deep beneath Fort Knox. I've never heard such utterly rash, hypercritical balderdash. If I weren't so stately and dignified, I'd take that molecule outside and bop him right in his little beezer. Who does he think he is? Little Caesar? Ah. Let the animal kingdom present its spokesman. Come on. Where is the gent? Right here, but your honor. All right, begin. It's a her. Never mind. Swear him in. Swear him in. Very well. The spokesman for the animal kingdom, etc. Species of bird, bee, dog, flea, hen, men. Does solemnly swear, etc. In the name of the Lama, New, Orc, Yacht, Kangaroo, Slippery Dan, Charlie Chan, the Common Man, and so forth, that he or she will please go forth and testify to the legal cause. Thank you. I'd gladly take the floor. Mm, rather pretty, eh bien? Hello? I could fascinate X with the mystery of our considerable natural history. I could tell him the fame of each colorful name. Go on, I'm goose pimply and blistery. I could tell of a bird named the Smew and another eclect. Urubu, of Tsikitai, Do, and a single row. And a fish that is called in canoe? Quite true. And a monkey that's called Wanderoo? Quite true. Oh, I just love to listen to you. I could tell of the vinegaroon, the squacko, the guiduck, baboon, the antelope bongo, the crow known as drongo. Will you join me for lunch one day soon? For the record, may I ask whether these names are real or fictionary? Don't interrupt. They're all in your dictionary. Now, the kapakai has a whistle. Of course. Distinct from the ling and dixistle. The Zebu and Zivet, and Tarek of Tibet. I cling to your words like a thistle. I urge X to join the Toucan or some other nice animal clan, like the beautiful Kuti or charming Aguti. But what of the species of man? Oh, that's another subject entirely. I do not recommend that X get involved in the affairs of mankind. Mm. Is that because you believe in the principle of matter over man's mind? No, but being human would surely hex a sensitive molecule like X. Just how do you mean, Queen? Well, 
It's not so easy to be a common man. No matter how much you work and plan, it's still a neat trick to live the span commonly allotted to the common man. A wandering breeze will affect your pump. If not a measle, then a mump. You can pull a tendon, get roundly hissed, or have to depend on an analyst. How true. You can get tomain or be undersold. Then there's Franco Spain. Free. And the common cold. A review can stink. You can miss a guess or be told how to think by the yellow press. Did I tell you I, I greatly admire your dress? No. There's water on the knee and athlete's toes, the doctor's fee and the running nose, aching bursitis, rashes and rickets, colitis and worsitis, and parking tickets. Not in this court. You can get diabetes or caught in the rain. Not in this court. You can run out of Wheaties or into a train. You can get neurasthenia. A blizzard can chill you. Your wife can be menia. A dentist drill you. A plaintiff can sue you. A bite give malaria. If no lover woo you, alas, miseraria. Mm. Very legal embroilments. Just let me take care of you. Thank you. A fascist will fight you. And then there is asthma. Vampires can bite you and whine on your plasma. You can be badly reared and flunk out in Latin or tangle your beard in spaghetti o gratin. It's fattening. You can get a flat tire, drop teeth in the drain, or suffer a dire escutcheon stain. You can drown in the Dnieper or suffer the bend. You can wind up a leper and lose all your friends. Hard to wind up a leper. You can settle in Philly or step in a pail or feel willy-nilly and cease to inhale. How morbid, depressing, in fact, suicidal. By the way, have you ever an hour that's idle? Your Honor, my client has something to say. I could meet you, uh... What's that about X again, eh? He's ready, I said. Well, let him go ahead. Uh, X says as follows. I'm glad to know the awful truth. Man has such woe, forsooth, forsooth. What philosophy. Yet what he's done, proud hands can clap. He's beaten the Hun and Will the Jap. He flies the air just like a smew and swims for fair like the in-canoe. Yes, like the in-canoe. He has a soul. He reads Descartes. Like me, his goal is a thing apart. He's learned to kill the harmful bug by serum pill and sulfur drug. He beats the band and goes to school to understand the molecule. You're the rascal. In face of odds, he makes his way. Gives birth to quads, builds TVA. Displays his charms, plays blindfold chess... Listens to Brahms and CBS. Mm, CBS, of course. The common guy both thinks and feels. Nothing's too high for his ideals. Though it cost him sadly to put down jerk. Please. He's not done badly. Look at his works. For all his pains, we owe him thanks. And I do gladly join his ranks. The human flock has golden fleece. Grace to its stock and lasting peace. Oh, splendid. What a moving speech. I had thought X a worm, a leech. But now I see he's a regular fellow. He's twanged me so I quiver like jello. Oh, joy, oh, rapture. Fields of clover. Looks to me like trial's over. Quite so. My dear X, forgive the digression, but I'm sure you'll be happy in your chosen profession. As for you, Miss Hanama, you are great. It's slightly extra legal, but uh, have you a date for later in the evening? Do you like to dance? Have you any marked tendency toward romance? I have. But what about the wife you seldom beat? And the children you have mentioned who grovel at your feet. Ho, ho, ho! Mere rhetoric and figmentary frippery. The legal mind behaves this way. It's, it's very smooth and slippery when arguing. I have no wife or any such a fixture. In that case, I will marry you, as in a Class B picture. We'll create a happy ending, plus two children of each sex. To be a part of one of them, uh, shall we invite friend X? Magnificent idea, that. Is our future child agreed? X says, indeed. And ask you speed your visit to the Reverend so we can have a life to lead and bring this to a clever end. Oh, Ray, I thought you'd never end. Will the court musicians kindly advance to the mic and play a wedding dance? And then after that, please segue and Sally into a sort of a kind of finale. One, two, three. <laughs> You've been listening to The Undecided Molecule, a rhymed fantasy written and directed and produced by Norman Corwin for CBS as the third of eight programs in the series Columbia Presents Corwin. Carmen Dragon composed the music, Lud Gluskin conducted. 
That gifted man, Robert Benchley, appeared as the interpreter for the molecule. And you can see me soon in the Paramount picture, Duffy's Tavern. It was Norman Lloyd who did that wonderful work as the highly competent official clerk. Quiet. Oliver Wendell Groucho Marx appeared as the judge. And I'm going to be together with my brothers on the stage and screen again in a night in Casablanca. Some one of these nights. Good night. Vincent Price is the prosecutor with convincing and smooth and even flick. And you can catch me soon in 20th Fox's Dragon Wick. It was Sylvia Sidney who convinced the molecule that being a human being can be fun. And if you'd like to see more of me, I'm appearing in a new film entitled Blood on the Sun. I, Keenan Wynn, in sound mind and body... I object. ...performed as the counsel for the defense of the molecule. And to give you an idea how versatile I am... I was also the spokesman for the vegetable mineral. week at this time, Columbia presents one of the most popular and often requested programs from last year's series, New York, a tapestry for radio, starring Orson Welles in the role of the narrator. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Overthrow Christmas, which has been going on for some time now. In fact, Norman Corwin wrote a play called The Plot to Overthrow Christmas, which has been broadcast on CBS for three years. Tonight, you will hear it again. This presentation is by way of a Christmas gift from CBS to its listeners on the principle that the best presents you can give your friends are the things you want for yourself. We wish you good cheer and ask you to follow the unraveling of The Plot to Overthrow Christmas by Norman Corwin. Did you hear about The Plot to Overthrow Christmas? Well, gather ye now from Maine to the Isthmus of Panama and listen to the story of the utter inglory of some gory goings-on in hell. Now, it happened in Hades, ladies and gentlemen. It happened down there that the fiends held a meeting. The fiends held a meeting for the purpose of defeating Christmas. With the aid of a fade, a fade on the radio, we'll take you there with a high and a hady ho to hear firsthand the brewing of the plot down in the deepest Stygian grot. Grot is a poetical term for grotto. Whenever you hear my voce sato, or sato voce, whichever you prefer, it's just I taking pains to make quite sure that nobody makes a poetical allusion which might in any way create confusion. And I return you now to the voice you were hearing before I had to do this interfering. As I was saying, in this Stygian grot, the notables of Limbo hatched a plot. And what went on in the sulfurous hole will soon pick up by remote control. Of course, such a pickup is not made quickly. As a matter of fact, it's done rather trickly. You mustn't mind if it sounds erratic. That's merely intraterrestrial static. And don't be surprised if you're deafened by thunder just as we start on our journey under. You'll hear earthquakes and all of the commoner varieties of natural phenomena. And so, below... Via radio to the regions where legions of the damned go.
How dare you interrupt me in the middle of a movement of my favorite concerto? You should look to the improvement of your manners. Sir, if you please, my apologies. I would not have intruded upon your recital if the matter were not so terribly vital. The most important matter in the world is piddling when it comes to be compared with Nero's fiddling. Now, what you say may be very true, but I have been sent here to summon you to a great mass meeting of the tortured souls down in the graft of the flaming coal. A meeting? What for? What's the big idea? Why can't a fellow have some peace down here? Peace? Poor soul can't be found on the premises. This is a region abounding in nemeses. Now you're talking like a travel folder. Tell me, Violet, before I smolder, why are we meeting? Who's on the spot? We're meeting in order to fabricate a plot. A plot against the festival that mortal men comfort in and gladden in again and again. You see, every year... Never mind the facts. I don't want to hear how mortal man acts. The only information about which I care concerns the mass meeting and who'll be there. His wickedness, Mephisto, will preside. Naturally. And several of the Borgias will be sitting at his side. And down in front, by the sizzling sodium, will be many personalities noted for their odium. Haman, Caligula, Medusa, and Legree. That's all very nice, but what about me? Oh, you'll be sitting in row A, center, between Ivan the Terrible, the Tormentor, and Cersei. Mercy! Why, they're both deranged! Do you wish me to see if your seat can be changed? Yes, if you will, please. Taste comes first, even though a soul may be eternally cursed. right oh. See you at the meeting, then. Yes, and now back to my fiddling again. This is I, the sotto voce person. It should have been explained that Nero's rehearsing for nothing in particular. He's just that way. While hell's fires burn, he likes to play. Makes him feel a little more at home. It's just an avocation he picked up in Rome. called you here from over 60 seas of boiling pitch and blazing phosphorus to stop what constitutes a loss for us. We've lost prestige, and I greatly deplore that we stand in danger of losing more in the way of confidence and spirit. We are far from our goal. We're nowhere near it. And this is the reason. Though we've done well in carrying forward the work of hell, we've left a very big job unfinished. After all these years, there is undiminished goodwill on earth every late December because of Christmas. Now, please remember that as long as this continues to be, the race of man will not belong to me. I will listen now to any questions you may want to ask, and then suggestions. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman. Brother Heyman has the floor. You say we have done well in our effort to sell evil. I say we have done better. We have carried out the letter of your law. We've done what I think is a pretty good job. And I say as a veteran demon... Sit down there, Heyman. Enough of this folly. Sit down yourself. You're off your trolley. Sit down, for I am Ivan the Terrible. You're telling us why you are unbearable. (laughs) Hello, demons. This is no way to act. Please proceed with a little more tact. I want more decorum in this forum. All personal remarks must cease. Now, Brother Ivan, will you speak your piece? I merely want to say in a casual way that Haman is a radical. He always gets fanatical. Why anybody think to hear him snort that the work of the Nazis should just stop short? Anybody think to hear him talking that Hitler and Hito should stop stalking the ways of the world? Mr. Chairman, Brother Ivan is a demagogue with a brain like a fly and the manners of a hog. Why, he says we... 
Now that's enough. We will hear from others. Surely there must be among you brothers enough venom and malevolence to crush a mortal man's benevolence. It's come to this. Are we going to let a little holiday like Christmas get the better of us all down here below? No, 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 no. Very well then, sirs. Very well. Let's go. Let's lay down our plans now to overthrow this Christmas business and all that guff of holly and mistletoe and stuff. (laughs) Brother Caligula may take the floor. Mr. Chairman, I abhor, as a former emperor, anything which curbs our rule. I suggest we start right in manufacturing more sin. Let us give some presents, too. Candy sticks and things to chew. Fruits and nuts and little cakes. Poisonous as rattlesnakes. Bravo! Let our subtlest worker be, um, bichloride of mercury. Let us wrap in tinsel bright little gifts of dynamite. Work things so that men will fear... When 12.25 draws near. (laughs) Soon at this rate, if you please, men will hang from Christmas trees. My dear Caligula, permit the chair to say that we think you've got something there. And now, with this fine start, let's hear some more. Uh, yes, Brother Nero, do you want the floor? With all due respect to Caligula's views, I think there's a better method we can use. I've just heard lately men are giving the razz to classical music by making it jazz. They're swinging it bark and what is keener. They're doing the shag to Palestrina. Here, here. As a connoisseur of music, of course I love the works of Rimsky-Korsakov. But today I note with a bitter shrug... They've made Scheherazade a jitterbug. (laughs) Much as we admire your clever rhyme, uh, will you get to the point where we're wasting time? I was just about to say, when interrupted, that Christmas can easily be corrupted. If you take and swing all the Christmas carols, why, think of the evil. Just barrels and barrels of sacrilege every time you play a pious song in a profane way. Why, once you entice them to swing Noel... Then victory belongs to us fiends. Well, <laughs> Mr. Legree, I like to say that it seems to me that you all barking up a coonless tree. I think Mr. Nero's made a wrong guess. The way to go about it is to get in Congress. Bribe a bunch of senators who know their oaths and just make a purchase of a block of votes. And then they can legislate a situation where they rule old Christmas right out of the nation. They can all get together and pass a law where there ain't going to be no Christmas anymore. I think the green suggestion is a beaut. That's very cute and quite astute. To me, uh, it seems a bit impractical because you have to be so uh, tactical. Why? For instance, now a senator who'd sell his vote to our lobbyists might very well sell right out again and become a tool of agencies representing the Yule. By the eternal night. That's right. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Miss Borgia. I say that we should all give pause to think about this uh, Santa Claus. He is the man behind the scenes, the symbol of what Christmas means. If we could uh, rub him out, my friend, our troubles would be at an end. Just think how it would tickle us to liquidate St. Nicholas. A girl like me could fascinate the guy and uh, then uh, assassinate? Do you think that you could do it, pretty one? Are you sure you wouldn't be by pity one? 
Sometimes you are an awful tease, my master Mephistopheles. Ain't I murdered several dozens, poisoned uncles, aunts, and cousins? Don't my work right here in Hades make me first among the uh, ladies? Men of virtue all have cussed me. I am sure that you can trust me. Of that we have the particle of a doubt, Miss Borgia. And I'm sure we all have nothing but kind feelings towards you. But many times a woman's spy, alas, adores her victims. Games make poor ambassadors. Do you imply that such defects are found inherent in my sex? I do. Well, listen here, old Ironsides. You're heading for some cyanides. You crossed a Borgia. And you know the consequences that follow. Come, come, disciples. This is very bad. There's nothing to be gained by getting mad. Suppose we put the matter to a vote. First, the plan of Brother Nero's, viz, to swing the hymns and pious music. All those four will please respond by raising up a paw. Four? And those against? Against! Against. Very well. Now, the project of Legrees. Who is there here who totally agrees? I do. Legree votes for himself. And those opposed? Opposed! And now, all those who favor Borgia's cause, it uh, being to eliminate uh, Santa Claus. Aye, aye, aye! And those opposed? <laughs> Seems the women have a way with them. At least they've uh, carried the day with them. <laughs> the motions carry it. And now we'll decide which one of us will take Nick for a ride. We'll all draw lots and thus settle the moot point of who will be sent to execute. Well, I... This is your old friend, Sotto Voce, visiting down where it's eternal noche. Noche is Spanish for night, you know. Merely a reference, just to show that English isn't all I have to go by. Oh, well... I guess I've missed my calling. I should have been a lobbyist. You see, I'm stalling to give them time to finish the voting. Let's see. The weather. Now I'm quoting the Daily Hellion. Continued heat both overhead and under feet. Fresh and moderate gases blowing up to gale force and then going north by westerly. Light showers of brimstone toward the evening hours. That's what it says here. I'm not fibbing. How am I doing with my ad living? This is a thing a gabbard have fun with. Say, the drawing should soon be done with. We expect the results at any moment now. As soon as... The lots have been drawn, and I'm glad to say the honor has fallen Nero's way. <laughs> You are charged with a great task. It's the evilest deed that we could ask a fiend to do. We'll be proud of you. Now, just one moment. How do I get there? Uh, what do I wear? Uh, is it dry or wet there? Is it fact or fancy or just word of mouth that he lives at the pole? Is it north or south? If he dwells in the regions to which I've referred, must I pass through a camp of Admiral Byrd? What shall I use when it comes to the showdown? A gun or a dagger? Well, give me the lowdown. Now, Nero, you needn't sound so tragic. You'll get to Earth by the blackest magic. To create an express elevator is simple for an expert spell creator. With a lot of pyrotechnic dazzle, we'll let you off on a hill in Basel, Switzerland. From there, you will make your way to the Arctic Circle, then break your way through ice with a blowtorch. After a while, you are bound to reach Santa's domicile. And once you get there, oh, my dear Nero, all of our work will have gone for zero. If you don't succeed in your assignment, a disadvantage of our confinement, in limbo is the fact that we only get one chance in all the eternal roulette. Of circumstance... I know. If at first we don't succeed, we can try, try again. But there is no need, because nothing will come of it. Meaning no offense. Do you mind if I take my departure hence? That, my friends, was a big brass gong. 
It's used in this story right along to indicate that we're about to travel to points where the plot will further unravel. And now, if Ambassador Nero elects, we'll have another spot of sound effects. Tell me, stranger... Basel, Switzerland, or is it already Donner and Blitzerland? Donner und Blitzenlands, 5,000 miles away. Thank you, mister. Good day. Tell me, stranger, I've been walking inland for weeks. Where am I now? In Finland. Tell me, stranger, because I've lost stock... Where am I now? In Vladivostok. This is stranger after all these centuries of blistering heat. Now I have to suffer from freezing feet. I'm wincing with pain from this pesky toe. No speak English. Eskimo. I declare by my frenetic soul... I must be over the magnetic pole. My watch has stopped. Can that be right? I wonder... Ah, a light. A light. In a moment now, you'll hear me knock on Santa's door, and he'll unlock it never more to lock again. <laughs> Coming. So is doom. <laughs> How do you do, sir? Very well indeed, and you, sir? Splendidly. Won't you come right in? Take your coat off. I see your chin is frozen. Also your hands and knees. Sit down while I get you some antifreeze. Don't bother, sir. I will not be long. I'm about to perpetrate a fearful wrong. In short, I am going to do away with... Take it easy. Do not play with that gun. I know all about you. Really? Haven't I had my agents scout you for weeks? You've come all this way to abolish Christmas. Now, let me say... Listen, Santa, I'm no callow stripling. I've read Ernest Hemingway and Kipling and also the shooting of Dan McGrew. And plenty of detective stories, too. And just to show you what a broad guy I am, I've also read... The ruby at of Omer Khayyam. Do you think that a fellow with his reading so graded could have learned so little as to be dissuaded from a main objective? Why, don't make me giggle. I'd feel a lot better if you wouldn't wiggle that gun so. Much as I'm impressed with your education, I honestly believe that a figure of your station should have given more thought to the ways of man and less devotion to the cult of Pan. By others, no doubt your wisdom may be prized. But I didn't come here to be criticized. In fact, I came to dispatch a duty. So don't hand me any of this tutti-frutti. If you have any last words you want to say, then spill them. I haven't got all day. Now, what's the rush? Unless I've counted wrong, the polar day has always been six months long. Well, after I've disposed of you, I've got to hurry. Right back to hell, they'll begin to worry. Not about you, but about your career in homicide. Do you think that the mere loss of you would make them hysterical? Their only interest is numerical. Think so? Mephisto wants to rule just as much of humanity as possible for reasons of personal vanity. By the sticks, you're right. To think that he'd dare... Are there any ladies here? Will you permit me to swear? My answer to that is an emphatic no. There are several lady dolls in the toy room below. Oh, Claudius. Oh, Cassius. Oh, Nathaline. What a fool I've been. What a fool I've been. Yeah, but wait. I think I see what you're after. 
You're as clever as a big-time Roman grafter. You remind me now of my royalty, just to get me in the mood for disloyalty. Do you think I could be that meanly deceptive to Satan? Why, Santa, I'm keenly perceptive. I can see right through all your clever ruses. Nero can be plenty foxy when he chooses. I'll have you know that I'm partly a dreamer, partly a wit, and partly a schemer. I'm part philosophical and also part mystic. I suppose you fancy that you're highly artistic. Fancy? Why, I have such a sense of beauty. Don't hand me a helping of Tutti Frutti. Any creature who really had beauty in his soul would appreciate Christmas. He would know that the whole idea of the holiday was one of such power that all the fiends below might gnash their fangs and glower, yet never in a million years could do it harm. Because it has a glory, a greatness, a charm you know nothing about. That so? The spirit that it venerates, the good cheer that it generates, are things far, far beyond you. For all your wealth, no man on earth could sell ye these. Am I so cursed as that? Will you tell me, please, what beauties there may be that I've never seen? Have you ever seen a Christmas tree, tall and green, smelling of woodlands covered with a sheen of silveriness, its branches bending low with the fruits of human kindness instead of snow? No. Have you ever closely witnessed what takes place any Christmas morning on a young child's face? or perceived any beauties purer than the joys distilled in the hearts of little girls and boys? Have you ever watched a fire in a fireplace on a Christmas Eve? Or listened to a grace at a table heavy with fruits and cakes and all the wonders that a kitchen makes, fowls and pastries, wines and meats, and nuts and raisins and candied sweets? Uh, have you ever seen mistletoe hanging from a ceiling? In frosty air, heard a far bell pealing. Have you ever come back from a sleigh ride, tingling, and your feet keeping time with the sleigh bells jingling? Have you ever seen the beauty of a sprig of holly? Or felt for a moment how it feels to be jolly? Golly. Have you ever known how exceedingly pleasant it is to unwrap a Christmas present? Did you ever know how much cheer it lends to be wished a Merry Christmas by all your friends? Did you ever experience the fun of giving? Do you know at all the joys of living? I guess I don't. For all of me, I never knew such things could be. Just think how long in ignorance I've slept. It must have been the company you kept. I was a wicked tyrant once, you know. Oh, yes, but that was centuries ago. You really had no way of knowing. Perhaps. I guess that I'll be going. I really should be getting on my way. But do you have to? Don't you want to stay? You see, I'm just a bit, uh... Embarrassed? Why, yes, sir. Now, don't look so harassed. I know just why you came and who it was that sent you. But that's all done with. I take it you repent you of all your past mistakes? With many pains and aches of conscience. We interrupt this broadcast for a special bulletin. The Algiers radio recorded by the CBS shortwave listening station has just reported that Admiral Jean Darlon has been assassinated. Said the Algiers announcer, complete order reigns in Algiers. Further details at 8.55 tonight. We return you now to the program... The plot to overthrow Christmas. Here. And uh, tell me, uh, will you have some wine or beer? Uh, I never touched the stuff myself, but I uh, managed to keep on hand a little rye for purposes medicinal. I mean, your chin should be unfrozen. What a state it's in. A while ago, you asked me if I understood good cheer. I do so now, St. Nicholas. I see it standing here. I want to ask you something, sir. Now, please don't give a yelp. Is there any sort of work to do where I can be of help? Indeed there is. Indeed there is. And I'm glad you asked me. I have so many toys to make. Uh, this year the job's got past me. But first you sit and eat this bowl. I've got a little trifle I'd like for you to see. 
So will you sit right here and stifle your curiosity? I'll get it for you right away. It's down the hall, please. Who'd ever think it? Will wonders never cease? At last, after all these centuries, I'm so happy I could buzz. It shows you what a lot a little Christmas spirit does. As emperor, I envied off the cheerfulness of peasant, and now I... Well, here it is, Nero, my boy. By way of Christmas presents, I offer you this little gift. But, Santa, for what reason? A very good one, sir. To wit, compliments of the season. Well, go ahead and open it. Why stand there so, reflecting? I'm just collecting thoughts, Saint Nick, my thoughts. I'm just collecting. Just think how far a tiny bit of fellowship will carry us. Oh, well. I say, what's this? What's this? It is a Stradivarius. Oh, thank you. Thanks a million times. I, I, I don't know what to say to you. I'll tell you what I'll do, St. Nick. I'll start right in and play for you. I'll play, I'll play, I'll play, I'll play. I'll play all night and day for you. Fine, here's some music. I'm sure you'll play it well. It's a little piece entitled Noel, Noel. This is I. Remember me, your solo voce friend? I'll just come back to tell you that the story's of an end. Once again, the plot to overthrow Christmas has been foiled. One year ago today, none of us knew whether on December 24th, 1942... We could do such a broadcast as the Norman Corwin holiday play you have just heard. However, we could and we did. And we rather think that the plot to overthrow Christmas will be thwarted again in 1943. This is Chesterton Radio, your home for podcasts of works by G.K. Chesterton, plus drama, comedy, mystery, science fiction, big bands, and much more. The soundtrack to your Chesterton day at ChestertonRadio.com. This is ChestertonRadio.com. This is Chesterton Radio, the true, good, and beautiful at ChestertonRadio.com. Between Americans, starring Orson Welles. The Gulf Screen Guild Theater. The Gulf Oil Companies and your good Gulf dealer are proud to present a dramatic picture of this, Our America. Here is your host, Roger Pryor, to tell you about it. Good evening, everyone. We welcome you tonight to one of the most timely programs ever heard on the Gulf Screen Guild Theater. Our production of Norman Corwin's script, Between Americans, starring Orson Welles. Broadcast at any time, we believe this program would make every American's heart beat a little faster. Make him hold his head just a little higher. But since the tragic and foreboding news that came today, this program, Between Americans, now becomes an American odyssey. In just a moment, our story will begin, but first... Here's Bud Heaston. Right. And here's an easy way to change from a pessimist into an optimist. If you're wondering now how long you may have to keep your present car, and wondering, too, if it will last, if it will stay in good condition, just look on the bright side of the picture. Remember, when you give the wearing parts of your car good protection, that helps it stay young and act young a long, long time. So give your automobile the modern method of lubrication, GoFlex registered lubrication. Here's why. First, expert Goflex operator works from a master chart of your model car, thus protects each wearing point in the chassis and body. Second, the Goflex man uses not just one or two greases, 
but six special lubricants, especially developed by lubrication authorities. And third, here's proof of how good these lubricants are. In recent tests by Gulf engineers, Gulf Flex chassis lubricant, for instance, stayed in the shackles 30% better and lubricated nearly 100% longer than the average of competitive products tested. So get Gulf Flex registered lubrication, a much better than usual grease job at no extra cost. Remember, too, that your good Gulf dealer is also ready with splendid motor oils and gasolines, such as Gulf No-Knox gasoline, the extra-value gasoline that has been especially designed to stop harmful pounding and hammering inside your engine. Make it a habit to stop regularly at your neighborhood good Gulf dealers, your headquarters for making your car last longer. And now, Oscar Bradley's music introduces Orson Welles, who will talk between Americans. program is Between Americans. That's where the title comes in. We hope you like it, but you don't have to. At any rate, nobody's going to make you stick around and listen to it. That's one of the advantages of being an American. Now, tonight we're doing something quite foreign to the type of thing usually presented by the Gulf Screen Guild Theater. Instead of telling a story about five or six people, we're telling a story about a hundred million. This happens to include you, listener, whatever your name may be. As a matter of fact, names don't bother real Americans very much. Not when we've got states named after French kings and English queens are lifted right out of the Latin language like Montana or out of the Spanish like Nevada and towns. You know, if you were to hold a convention of all the people who live in foreign-sounding American towns, we could fill quite a sizable stadium. Among the delegates registering on the first day would be... Me, I'm the delegate from London. Minnesota. I'm in from Dublin, New Hampshire. Flew in this morning from Cairo, Illinois. Huh? Uh, who's turned me? Uh, I'm from Canton, Connecticut. I'm from Paris, Texas. I came all the way from Shanghai, West Virginia. Warsaw, Georgia. I'm the delegate representing Moscow, Kentucky. My town is Toronto, Kansas. As for me, Lisbon, Maine. Delegate from Madrid, Alabama reporting. I'm from Stockholm, South Dakota. Drove down this afternoon from Bombay, New York. Hitchhiked here from Baghdad, Florida. All right, delegates, now that you've registered, you may all be seated. Now, that's all the preliminaries there's going to be tonight. We're through with the introductions, the overture, and the official registration. So now we can get down to the text, which is roughly speaking this. Today, particularly, people are thinking about their country pretty hard. Some of them for the first time in their lives. People are wondering where we're headed. Men are being called on to get ready to defend America. A lot of them are thinking in terms of what is there to defend. Well, now, America means a lot of things to a lot of people. Most of them are solid patriots, only they don't know it. They don't have to wear a red and white and blue button in their lapels to prove it. They don't have to agree with or even listen to people like this. My fellow citizens! In this great state of Florida and Pantero, we can pick the dog squirtle your taxes. Our great country is gribbly bolted up and can wackle tablewax, and your lag and I will arrive done forever. We got a good hunch most people prefer the quiet kind of speaker, like the fellow who got up on a platform in a Pennsylvania town one day and said, The world will little note nor long remember what we say here. That was the Gettysburg Address he was referring to. As a matter of fact, he didn't get such good reviews the next morning. Take, for example, the write-up he got in the Harrisburg Patriot. We pass over the silly remarks of the president. For the credit of the nation, we are willing that they shall no more be repeated and thought of. If you think that's bad, listen to what the Chicago Times had to say. The cheek of every American must tingle with shame as he reads the silly, flat, and dishwatery utterances of the man who has to be pointed out to intelligent foreigners as the President of the United States. Of course, the rival paper in Chicago took the opposite point of view. Rival papers often do. The remarks of President Lincoln will live among the annals of man. 
That paper gave it four stars, and they were right. The Gettysburg Address did survive. But that business of calling a president a ham is really something to be proud of. I mean the right to print a piece saying a president makes a sound like dishwater. Nobody dragged the editors off to jail, even if they were wrong. That's important. Comes under the heading of free press. As soon as anybody starts gagging the press, any press, watch out. Americans don't like that. And by the way, we got a nerve to be calling ourselves Americans all the time when we're really only United Staters. We're a little selfish about that. It's America down there in Chile, too. All the way down the spine of the Andes. If any of you folks are hearing this down around Mexico or Honduras or Salvador or Argentina, or even if you're an Eskimo in the Arctic, we hope you'll overlook our calling ourselves Americans as though we were the only ones in the hemisphere. We do that just because it's so much easier to say than anything else, and also because it sounds so good. And by the way, before we leave the subject, what about the original Americans? The Indians? There's a forgotten race for you. How about the Indian on the nickel and the buffalo who roamed the back of the great American jit? Seems a shame. No two ways about it. We have forgotten those 100% Americans who went down to quarantine to meet the Mayflower. We don't see them around in person very much these days. But their ghosts are still with us. Maybe the red men are forgotten. Maybe not. But between you and us, it's said that near Boonesboro, Kentucky, on certain nights in November, by the light of the waning moon, some very peculiar ghost meetings go on in the woods south of the river. Also in certain parts of the Alleghenies, between the hours of sundown and the coming of the morning mist. Yes. If you happen to be listening to this in a car, driving along Highway 99 in Wyoming, that man you passed walking down the road a few miles back wasn't a man at all. Seriously, they were brave people. The Indians fought a losing fight against great odds wanted nothing more than to keep their land and their way of life. Fighting the fight so many people of all races have had to fight since. The fight to keep free and independent. The fight to stop men from the outside who want to civilize somebody their way. You ever ask yourself what America means to you? Does it mean 1776? Columbia, the gem of the ocean, big business, the Bill of Rights, Uncle Sam. Chances are it means none of these things. Chances are it means something very personal to each of you. Something close to your heart which you'd miss like the very blazes if you were stranded abroad. Might have nothing at all to do with quotes from Madison or acts of Congress. It might be just the feeling about the crisp autumns in New England and the smell of burning leaves. It might be the memory of the way they smooth off the infield between the games of a doubleheader. It might be a thing as small as your little finger. Have you ever been abroad and run out of American cigarettes? Hey, you uh, speak English, mister? No, senor. Solo hablo espanol. Well, anyway, uh, do you carry cigarettes? Ah, cigarillo. Si, tenemos bastante aquí. No, I just want cigarettes. Uh, here, I'll take these. How much? Veinte centavos. Here, keep the change. Hey, uh, got a light there, senor? Si, como no, senor. Un momento. <coughs> hey, what is this? Soft, cold soup? <laughs> Tastes like an old shoe. Here, you can smoke the rest of them. <laughs> there you are. America might mean a tight pack cigarette, which tastes good. Might mean the way a hot dog man slaps mustard on a Frank. Might mean going with your wife to the movie on bank night or taking your girl to the annual barn dance and social at Tuckerman's Barn. Plenty of you listeners know what I'm talking about. Thank you. 
You hear people speak of home defense? This is the home, the home to be defended. The square dance down the Glen of East, no man Tuckerman's barn. This is the America of all the couples dancing there tonight. That's what the nation means to Butch and Fred and Jenny and Alvira. And this is America to all the boys and girls from Malvern County and their folks at home waiting for them. What do you suppose America means to that auto repair man in the grease cake dungarees who works in the garage in the corner of Willow and Elm Street? It means quite likely crawling under the 1936 Buick and dragging an electric light bulb on a long extension after him. Hey, Joe, hand me that wrench. What wrench? The wrench at your feet. I got to finish this apprentice job. Why don't he sell that jalopy and get a new boat? Hey, you want to talk us out of business? As long as he keeps his car, we get a repair job once in a while. Yeah, guess you're right. Sure. That's America to Pete and Joe. Piston job, transmission job, valve job, jack it up, change the tire. New fan belt, check the pump. On Saturday night, take the girl down to Joyland Dance Park. Means repairs to those boys and cans of oil and carburetor mixtures. And to Jack Prentice, who owns the Buick that Pete is fixing and who lives down on the beach near the Coast Guard station, America means the sound and the sight and the smell of high tide under the full moon. Occasionally the melancholy note of the bellboy drifting up when the wind's blowing in from the ship channel means the age-old sound of the sea. The same sound folks are hearing this very minute up around Penobscot Bay in Winthrop Beach and Chincoteague Inlet down by Calabogue Sound and on Boca Chica and then clean over to the other coast by Guadalupe, Carmel. Yes. Wind and waves and sand, and rock, and riptide, and undertow. That's America to Jack Prentice and the hundreds of thousands of folks settled on the coastlines between Eastport and Key West, Point Isabel, and Birch Bay. America is all things to all the people, prairie to Nebraskans, coal to Scranton miners, cameras and raw celluloid to the picture boys in Hollywood, the stink of crude oil to the men who work the wells, Relief checks to the unemployed, a mic and a stopwatch to a radio production man, a BMT Express to Brooklyn office workers. Sure, that's the way it goes. Or isn't it? What does this country mean to you? It might mean anything. Anything at all. It might mean a course in highfalutin poetry at Harvard. Today, gentlemen... We will consider the influence of Whitman on the development of poetry in America. And by 1870, after 12 years of incessant attack against squeamish over refinements, Whitman really began to create an active distaste for literary effects. Or else it might be an argument between two baseball fans as to which is the better team, the Yankees or the Red Sox. Yeah, but look! The Yanks are a bunch of old men and cripples. Yeah, yeah. They won't last. I tell you, they yeah. won't last. Well, it gets good and hot around the middle of July. Yes. Well, look, double headers begin piling up. What are you talking? Listen, the man's just having the best season he ever had. Ah. He's an old man, huh? Keller hitting a dozen homers. Ah. I'd like to be a cripple like that. No home run record for the club. Won't last, huh? Who's the Red Sox got as good as the Mayors? Name one guy. Name one. Oh, name two. Ted Williams. Well, a good hitter. No getting away from that. What you say? Better than the man? Attention. Wait a minute. Do you say... Or it could be a poker game in Charlie Ferreter's law office upstairs over the five and ten cent store on a rainy afternoon. Or a meeting of the Kiwanis Club in the mansion house on Thursday. Or the news store. Or a great symphony concert sent out over everybody there playing the music of all the world's great composers regardless of their race or nationality. For instance, something by a great German Jew named Mendelssohn something you couldn't play in certain countries on the other side. Now let's stop a minute and figure this out. Is it an accident that makes just being a citizen in this 
comparatively young country so attractive to so many people, to the world's greatest skater from Norway, to the world's greatest mathematician from Germany, to the world's greatest orchestra conductor from Italy? Is it an accident that a thousand million people all around the world would give everything they own to be in your shoes? A free citizen of this country right this very minute? Is it the weather here? Let's ask some of the natives. You from New York, how's the weather out your way? Oh, I like it all right, only the summers give me a pain, sticky and hot. And then we usually get a stretch of terrible overcast weather around April and November. Sometimes ten days go by without the sun coming out once. And you, miss, from Miami, Florida. Oh, our climate's fine. Except you have to watch out for sunburn. A gentleman from Kansas? Well, summers get pretty hot. Winter's pretty cold. Tornadoes raise a ruckus every once in a while. Los Angeles. You. Ah, wonderful climate. Magnificent. Don't you ever get tired of all that sunshine? <laughs> no, sir. Not a bit. <laughs> Never rain? Well, a little precipitation, maybe, but no rain. <laughs> no earthquake? No, just little ones. <laughs> Are you interested in some real estate? Uh, no, thanks. Oh. <laughs> and uh, you from San Francisco, uh, how about it there? Best climate in the world, top. Lots of sunshine? Lots. Lots of fog? Lots. All right. <laughs> then it's not the weather which makes us so attractive. Is it maybe our wine, women, and song? Let's ask the experts. Uh, you there, expert on women. American women are beautiful, certainly. But we've never produced any classic or historic beauty. We've no legendary figure to compare with Helen of Troy, or with any of the Greek or Roman Venuses, or with Egypt's Cleopatra. As far as fiction is concerned, we can offer nobody to stand up against Italy's Juliet, or Germany's Isolde, or France's Roxanne. Certainly not, Scarlett O'Hara. Certainly not. No, indeed. All right, that's fine. Thanks very much. Now, what about our wines? Is that what makes America so attractive from the outside looking in? How about it, wine expert? American wines are excellent, but then, of course, meaning no offense, have you ever heard of French champagne, burgundy, Libre Mille, All Mille, right, Mille, thank Yardo? you. Uh, thank you. Can it be our song? Maestro. America can well be proud of its composers and of its wealth of folk music. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that we have yet to produce a single world great symphony, whereas Finland has produced seven, Germany and Austria half a hundred, the Russians about twelve, the French two or three, England two or three, Bohemia... Not song, then. Neither wine, women, nor song. So what is it, then? Well, it's this. Come right down to it. It's the spectacle of nearly 150 million people trying to live up to the expectations of a handful of great men who lived and died 150 years ago. Men who were so fed up with the kind of government they'd been getting, they sat down and wrote a new constitution for themselves and their children. A democratic constitution that's been added to, but never been topped before or since. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. Or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and petition the government for a redress of grievances. No person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. The right of trial by jury shall be preserved. Excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. The right of the citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Or on account of sex. Those are pretty good sentiments to be kept alive and flourishing in the world today. Of course, there are other things that makes our union a good one to belong to. It's a beautiful country, even though it has a lot of incorrigible badlands and corrigible slums. 
Aren't many countries have as much in them to look at and wonder about as this one? This can be a rather fierce country, too. Ever see the way its mountains frown down sometimes? Know what they're frowning at? Some rumors they heard about petty intrigue, about political bosses and shysters and fakers and grafters and men who make a business of jipping the people. Ever see the way the sky suddenly gets black and the thunder roars and the lightning starts throwing itself around? Ever see a storm whipping it up across the Great Lakes? That's how the American winds feel about anybody who denies anybody else a fair trial or free speech or the right to assemble or the right to worship as one sees fit. Well then, in the final analysis, there can be no analysis. Many great thinkers and poets have attempted it but the country's too big for any one man. There's Walt Whitman and Carl Sandburg and Tom Wolfe, and they all felt the magnitude and magnificence of the nation that got put together piece by piece like a jigsaw puzzle. They felt it and wrote about it in unforgettable ways. But still, it's bigger than any of them, or any of us. Whitman hit it on the nose when he said it was bigger than the president and the cabinet in the District of Columbia. It's not Park Avenue, or Broadway, or 42nd Street, or the Loop, or the Golden Triangle. It's other things. Many, many, many other things. Mill towns. Hill towns. Tobacco towns. Mining towns. Oil towns. Cotton towns. Farmhouses. Railroad sightings. Statues on the common. Tourist houses on the edge of town along the state highway. Swimming holes. Gas stations. Strollers on Main Street. Kettles of sorghum molasses. Sunday papers. Season tickets to concerts. Auctioneers. Night courts. Radios. Parades. Toothpaste. Shaving cream. Dogs. Cats. Skyscrapers. Subways. Cornfields. Offices. Hotel rooms. Airports. Hospitals. Factories. Oh, we could go on for weeks with this. Never come any closer to a working definition of America. But to any real understanding of its total meaning, look, how can you add up all the red and yellow neon signs, the smell of all the eggs and bacon frying in the morning, the bargain specials, the lessons learned, the cows let in from pasture, the mileage clocked up on automobile speedometers, the rainfall and the snowfall, and the wind drifts. It's much too big for you, or me, or any of us who happen to stand alone or in small groups. It's much too great for any person or any party, too much loved by all its people, loved in spite of and because of its faults and virtues and its past mistakes and future promises. America is not a map, a poem, an almanac, a mural, a building in the heart of Washington. It's a territory possessed by people, possessed by an ideal. Well, that's all, listeners. Just wanted to talk between Americans for a half hour of a Sunday evening. No big finish here. No brass section bringing down the curtain. Just a little music to follow a friendly little chat. Good night, Americans. just heard Orson Welles talking between Americans. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Orson Welles has
has just spoken to you as one American to another. And incidentally, do you remember when Orson mentioned the hundreds of thousands of Americans working in those oil towns and gas stations? Well, those Americans make up a great industry that's a vital part of America, the oil industry. There are about 400,000 gasoline dealers helping traffic flow along the highways, making possible business trips, visits to your friends, the stores and movies, pleasant rides in the country. That's only part of the oil industry's contribution to making the American way of life the grand thing it is. And to keep it that way, to safeguard our way of life, well, the industry's helping there, too. It's supplying fuels and lubricants for factories busy turning out materials for our defense. In addition, the oil industry is supplying all the gas and oil needs of the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force. And for the vastly augmented Air Force planned in the future, Gulf and other oil companies are building enough 100 octane aviation fuel plants to take care of the increased demand. That's only a glimpse of what the oil industry, of which Gulf is a part, means today to the American people and the American way of life. For next week, we really have a show that'll put you into a great humor. The RKO hit, My Life with Caroline, starring those top favorites, William Powell and Anne Southern with George Barbier. Music by Oscar Bradley, assisted by Frank Tours. Until then, this is Roger Pryor speaking for your neighborhood good golf dealer and saying, good night, everyone. Orson Welles appeared tonight through the courtesy of Lady Esther and is currently making the magnificent Ambersons at RKO. Don't forget our date next week when the Gulf Screen Guild Theater brings you William Powell, Anne Southern, and George Barbier in My Life with Caroline. But Houston speaking, this is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>